Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, January 10th, 2022. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes. John Hurd? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. This is the first scheduled meeting of the select board for calendar year 2022. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Before I turn to item two on the agenda, I would like to read the land acknowledgement that the board supported last spring in town meeting approved through a resolution and which is also contained on the town's website. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. I will now turn to item two on tonight's agenda, the consent agenda. There is one item this evening, the minutes of the meeting of December 20th, 2021. This is the regular meeting of December 20th, 2021. Uh, and I'll start with Mrs. Mahan. Um, move approval, no questions. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Second. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. No comments. Mr. Helmut. No comments. Okay, on motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmut? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, item number three for approval, establishment of Veterans Memorial Park gift account. Jeffrey Chunglo, Director of Veterans Services. Is Mr. Chunglo with us this evening, Mr. Chaplain? Yes, he is. I just promoted him to panelist. There he is. Good evening, Mr. Chungla. He's just about with us. Good evening, Mr. Chungla. Good evening. I, as soon as I click join the meeting, it rebooted for a second. So, so I'm sorry about that, but um, First of all, 
thanks for having me participate and I hope everyone enjoyed the holidays and happy new year. You as well. So I, I was bounced out when you had started your uh, discussion. So I'm not sure exactly what was mentioned before I signed back in. Yeah, I, I just introduced the item. So if you could tell us um, about establishing the, the account and, and we're aware of the, um, we had voted earlier um, or last year, actually just before Veterans Day um, <laughs> to, to um, create the, or keep the park, the Memorial uh, Park uh, near the fire station. But if you could tell us about the gift count and what you're looking for from us this evening. Sure. Um, so I had planned to do this anyways in the future uh, once we started collecting funds for the new Veterans Memorial Park. Um, I recently had a veteran pass away, uh, World War II veteran, Kathleen Adler, uh, who was 99. Uh, she passed away uh, last week. So um, in lieu of flowers, she requested that don donations be made to uh, Department of Veteran Services. So um, I reached out to, uh, to Rita uh, to establish or the process for establishing um, a budget item or a line item for uh, donations for the park to establish that new account. So, uh, so I have received uh, a number of checks um, and it's, it's a good starting place for the new Veterans Memorial Park. And I just uh, ask that you accept uh, the proposal to establish that new account. Attorney Heim, just a question on, is there, is it just a vote that we need to establish the account? Is there anything else that we need, to, any other further action that we need this evening? Yes, sure. I don't think there's a further action that the board will need to take. Um, there may be um, some further action that needs to be taken by, um, I mean, the board essentially, the primary function is to accept uh, funds either by donation or grant and any conditions that are tied to them and make sure that they're acceptable in terms of who they're being received from. Those are the sort of primary gatekeeping functions that the board serves. But in this particular case, I think at this juncture, uh, what Mr. Chungo is describing is the, it's the only action that the board needs to take. Okay, thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, and I will turn to the board now. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Hurd. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve the request to establish an account to accept gift funds for the new Veterans Memorial Park. And I look forward to what becomes of it. And again, Mr. Chungo, thank you for all your work that you do and your advocacy on this on the, the issue for our veterans in town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, I'd like to second that. And, and um, please again, Mr. Chungo, who was the, the person who asked that um, donations be made? In, in lieu of yes. Um, uh, so it was um, the the family of Catherine Adler. So she was a Marine Corps veteran, World War II, um, had a very uh, storied career, um, set some milestones, and um, so it was her family that requested that the donations be made. Yeah, I mean, um, World War II. I mean, um, I mean, we'd love to know more about that story, and, and certainly appreciate what her family is doing I mean, in, in this realm. So um, uh, once again, I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I enthusiastically support the motion and uh, express my gratitude to uh, Ms. Adler's family uh, for her service and for uh, honoring her memory of her service um, in this wonderful way. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any questions because I know our veteran services um, director um, will have this running smoothly um, and promptly as with everything else he does. And I'm also grateful for, there's a lot of contacts that Mr. Chunglo does just silently. Um, and we probably wouldn't even known about this one. So, so um, but for this account being established and the generosity of the Adler family, and, and we thank her her service and her family, because as anyone who's 
married to or related to a military spouse, it really is also a family sacrifice. So uh, as always, the board is available to you, Mr. Chunglo, with any help that you need. Um, and you've always kept us in the loop and apprised of what's going on and we'll all be your biggest advocate. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, and I support this as well. I believe Ms. Adler may have been 99 years old when she passed. She, um, her relatives, the McNamara family in Arlington, Gert McNamara is her younger sister. And I, I um, yeah. condolences to the family, but but also the, I had heard of, about Ms. Adler's service and, and uh, I did want to thank the family um, as well uh, for, for identifying the veterans uh, services for the, for the gift account. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, uh, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Chunglo. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Okay, item four, uh, board discussion, uh, removal of double polls. Um, the board will recall that uh, I started a practice that if Eversource or Verizon comes in, uh, that we have a update on the double poll situation in town. And I do have some news to report. Um, when I first had made this um, an agenda item uh, back in October, um, I had cited statistics from October 31, 2020, where according to the DPU report that Verizon filed, or the report filed with the Department of Public Utilities, there were 148 double polls as of October 31, 2020. As of October 31, 2021, that number is 114 double polls. So there is progress being made. Um, however, um, there is a detailed list that is provided or that the Verizon provides to the DPW by community. Um, and we're gonna post that in the town. I'm gonna ask for a vote to post that on the town's website and ask residents to um, take a look at it and add any of the locations that are missing because that, look, that, that report that shows 114 double polls shows two double polls on Mass Ave. I use that as a sample. If you drive the length of Mass Ave, there are at least seven double polls. Um, so there are some gaps in the reporting. And so while on the one hand, we're pleased to see that there has been some pro positive progress, I think there's some real questions on the completeness of the double poll report. And the double poll that I had uh, pointed out at the meeting back in October on the corner of Adams Street in Mass Ave, probably the worst one in the town, doesn't appear on the double poll list. So that, that explains why it hasn't been hasn't been removed. So uh, what I'd like the board to consider, and if I could ask the town manager, uh, ACMI ran a story about this back in November on their November 12th newscast. They actually reached out to Verizon um, for a comment on the number of double polls. And this is the response that they um, had received. And I want to thank ACMI for the completeness of the story. But Verizon responded that they're currently up to date for all their double poll work in Arlington. And essentially that the reason that the double polls haven't been replaced is that they're awaiting work from other parties. And uh, the town manager and I have spoken about this. And I think it's, um, we should request, uh, think about requesting, and I'll, I'll open it up to the board, um, a meeting with representatives from Verizon, Eversource, um, RCN and Comcast, um, they are the parties that, that would have wires on the polls, just to get an understanding as to what the communication is and what happens, because for the primary party to say that they're currently up to date when there are 114 polls and are in compliance with the statute, I think we need to do better uh, in terms of what the communication is. So with that background, I will turn to the board uh, and I'll start with Mr. Diggins. Sorry about the delay, Mr. Chair. And, um, well, clearly it's an issue, I mean, and so um, I, mean, I support in um, your pursuit of this matter. And um, I mean, is there a motion that you want to come out of this? If you would like, I mean, I, I suggested 
action to request a meeting with the parties and to also publish the list and ask residents um, to report back if, if any of these sites are missing. Well, I, I certainly support that and I'm happy to make that motion. Great. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, any other comments? No other comments. Okay, uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, I'm very glad to second that. I think that, um, you know, I appreciate Verizon's response, but uh, I think the danger for this when you have multiple parties is that they can all wait for the other and point fingers at the other. And, you know, that does not serve the residents of the town very well at all. So I think uh, both having this meeting and, and inviting the citizens to, to help with this tracking and accountability is a really good idea. And I, I wanna thank the chair for refocusing the boards and the town's attention on the double poles each time that the utilities come for us for, ne for necessary approvals. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, has it been seconded? Yes, I believe Mr. Helmuth seconded. Okay. I apologize. I was reading the teeny little prints on this and I wasn't focusing, so my apologies. Um, I think it's definitely a good idea. Um, we're gonna post this um, double pole grid document that you've provided the rest of the board with. And um, is it my understanding we're gonna ask residents, I have two part question on that. I'm gonna ask residents to report directly to the town if they don't see their double pole or know of a double pole that isn't on this list. And or I know residents will, some residents might say, well, I wanna send something directly to you know, Verizon or whomever, um, or is it, we just want to gather this information and go forth from there. Yeah, I, I spoke to the town manager about posting, I think maybe in the first instance is to report to the town. Certainly people could contact Verizon if they want, but I also want to let the public know that, that the list that we're going to publish is actually a list that Verizon files with DPU. It is a public document. Um, so what we're reporting is, is, is a matter of public record already. But I, I, I think it, Mr. Chapdelin, maybe you could respond. I, th I think if we'd like the public maybe to reach out through us so that we can reach out to, to Verizon to suggest corrections to the list if, if there need to be corrections. I think that sounds right. Um, we could either designate a staff member to receive those emails or even set up an inbox specifically for this purpose and direct people to send an email um, stating the location of the poll and we can double check the list. Okay, and uh, I definitely support um, the uh, various party joint meeting that the chair um, is suggesting to us. Um, I don't think we need to vote on that. That's just something that um, the chair would schedule. I just would put it out there. Um, would it be um, beneficial to have, or maybe first communicate with a cable advisory committee chairperson, um, where we are bringing in some of these cable companies. Um, they may say th they would be valuable there. They may just want to send in a statement. And then the other thing is, I um, mean, this is for something for the chair and the town manager to sort of room discuss about is um, should we perhaps at that meeting um, invite our legislative delegation. Um, that's just a thought, uh, I'm not saying it has to happen. So, um, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with you on that point to, to maybe as we go forward, once we get a response from the various companies in terms of timing, um, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, <clears throat> happy to support the motion and thank you for your continued advocacy on this issue. Um, just one question on the chart that we had sent, the shorter of the two. So there's two categories of jointly owned polls, it looks like, and one set has Eversource and Verizon, the other one just hasn't flipped. So is there significance to who is owner number one? Do they have, are they kind of, who, the, who we would have to talk to to get the poll removed? Yeah, and, and maybe Mr. Chaplain, you can fill in maybe if I, I miss it. My understanding is that in different communities, whether it's Verizon or Eversource or another utility, where there are joint owners, one of the companies is, is given primary responsibility for maintaining the double poles or replacing them. In Arlington's case, it's Verizon. So that's why they, um, we do see a, there is 28 poles now that are 
let's say Eversource is the primary owner, but my understanding is Verizon has primary responsibility in Arlington to gather the other um, companies when a pole is being replaced. Is, is that right, Mr. Chaplain? Yes, that's accurate. Okay. Okay. So I was just going to note that it looks like Verizon's responsibility is lacking on their responsibilities more than Eversource, but the 89 poles that they're primary on. But thank you for the explanation. Um, happy to support the motion. Great. Thank, thank you. So on a, a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, a two-part motion. Uh, Attorney Hunter. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Um, yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we did list at 7.30 public hearings. It's now 7.36. We will do these in order and we will start with item number five, Eversource petition from Massachusetts Avenue, Jacqueline Duffy, supervisor of rights and permits. And while we're waiting for Ms. Duffy to join us, I do wanna point out that she appeared before us in October within a day, no more than two days after the meeting, she did reach out to Eversource and I believe reached out to Verizon about the poll on Adam Street and, and on Mass Ave, as well as the other one across from Elmsworth Road. So I wanna thank Ms. Duffy for taking the initiative after the last meeting and I wanna welcome her to the hearing um, if she can hear us. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? Um, I, had you? Sent, I had sent an email to Verizon after that meeting that we had and I never received a response. I believe it was before a, a storm that we were going to get because that pole was so badly damaged and I never got a response back. I believe I sent it to Diane to show her that I sent it to them. I don't know what's going on uh, with Verizon. Yeah, no, I actually, while you were signing on, I, I thanked you for doing that because I was aware that you had reached out after the last meeting. Yes. I was, okay. I was, we were switching me over to be a panelist. That's why I didn't hear you. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, no. Thank you for doing that. And, and uh, we as well haven't heard anything. So we will continue to try to, to try to do that. So on the petition, I believe this relates to work that needs to be done for Arlington High School. If you could tell us a little bit about the uh, petition and the work that's proposed to be done. Yes, we're, in, we're, yeah, we're requesting to install 1,480 feet of conduit. <clears throat> and this is to accommodate the Arlington High School. Great. Okay, I will turn to the board um, and I'll start with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I'd like to move approval and I have no questions. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Um, I would like to second that and just say to Ms. Duffy, as the chairman noted, as you were switching over, um, I had shared the information um, that Ms. Duffy uh, had sent me the next day with the, the chair and the town manager. Um, and, and I know they acted on that. And unfortunately, they've gotten the same response that you have, Jackie, which is nothing, crickets. But um, we're just going to keep on keeping on until we can get to the bottom of this. But I do want to thank Ms. Duffy for, um, I, I know she even, as Mr. DeCourcy, the chair said, sent some pictures um, that the chair had included as information. So. Um, we do appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Okay. Mahoney. Mr. Hurd. Support it. No questions. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do support it. Um, I, I have a couple of uh, questions. I mean, I think this will go to the town manager through you, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, nice to meet. So um, I, I assume that this one, this um, engineering memo is done by Mr. Chenard. I noticed that the other two were, but there's no um, name associated with this one. I assume he does them all. I mean, I, I would assume the same, Mr. Diggins, though it, it's certainly possible that Mr. Coppathorn could stand in if necessary to draft I, a memo. I got you, you know, so that's fine because I, mean, I, I know that both of those are very detail oriented. I mean, I, I noticed that these are, I mean, they're, they're detailed, but a little boilerplate too. I mean, and so, so, um, so I mean, I, I, I trust them to, to um, be, make sure that anything that is different in these um, to be um, addressed in particular. Um, will be done. And um, the second one is, um, I noticed that it, it's like if, if any brick sidewalk um, 
or any sidewalk is removed, it'll be replaced with, with brick sidewalk. I, mean, I, I take it that we have to replace it with whatever was there initially, right? Yeah, I'm not familiar with any brick sidewalk in that location. So that that must be carried over from another memo. Okay, all right. That's what, so, so, but to, to the question that I was really getting at, though, it's like, do, so we would have to replace it with, with what was there, though, right? We usually try to do like for like, yes. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. Um, that's it, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, just one question, and, and this is for the, the town manager, maybe for Attorney Heim. Um, we do have a list of conditions, and typically we'll make the approval subject to the conditions, but condition nine refers to the um, construction moratorium. And I don't know if that's, um, something that is just being put in there to, 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 to make us aware of that date. I mean, this work needs to be done before the new high school opens. So to the extent that that is there, um, I may want to suggest and, and ask the manager if, they, if he believes this would be appropriate to, to waive that condition for this project because they may have to do work in the public way between now and, and uh, when the school opens in February. I, I would agree. I think waiving that condition makes sense. And, and it would track with precedent um, on other projects. Engineering and or the board has waived or put the construction moratorium, the winter construction moratorium on hiatus for expediting gas leaks repairs or gas main replacement to repair gas leaks or to uh, affect the timely installation of infrastructure. And this would fall under that category. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any further questions. I just want to ask uh, Mr. Helmuth if wouldn't mind making a friendly amendment for the conditions with the exception of that one, number nine. Yes. Good catch. Thank and, you. And if Mrs. Mahan, if that's acceptable for the second. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a public hearing. So if members of the public wish to be heard on this item five, uh, we will open it up uh, right now. Um, I don't know if there's anybody who has signaled they want to address the board on this one. I am not seeing any hands raised at this time. Okay. All right. So on item number five, the, on a motion for approval by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duffy. I, could I just say one thing? Um, when you said like for like, yes, we do replace like for like. If it is a brick sidewalk, we uh, we have those a lot in Cambridge. Just to let you know, it is a like we do replace like for like. Okay, thank you for that, that information. You're welcome. Great. Have a good evening. You too. Okay, items number six and seven are national grid petitions. Um, I am consistent with my prior practice, I am going to recuse myself uh, from participation in each of these items, items six and seven, because uh, the legal work that I do for, for National Grid. Um, so I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Mrs. Mahan uh, at this point for these two items. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for passing the virtual gavel. Um, now we have uh, two petitions for National Grid. I believe it says, um, Ms. Mary Mulroney um, will be representing. Is she on the list? She is joining us by phone. And if you're ready, I can allow her to address the board. Yes. And I'll say the first number six is the National Grid Petition, Oakland Avenue. And um, Ms. Mulroney, whenever you're ready. Good evening. Um, thank you for having me. Um, which petition would you like to start with? Um, if it's OK, the Oakland Avenue. Sure. Um, National Grid respectfully requests your consent to install and maintain 55 feet of four inch plastic main from the existing four inch cast iron main to service um, a new house at 292 Oakland Ave and Arlington. And from that main extension, they will install a new two inch plastic service to the point of entry of the home. Okay, thank you. Um, First, uh, any questions um, from my colleague? I'd like to start with Mr. Diggins. No questions. Are you entertaining motions now, Ms. 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 Chair, Madam Chair? Sure. 
Yeah, yes. so I, I, I'll be happy to make a motion to um, approve this um, request. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Hellman? Thank you, I second the motion, no questions. Mr. Hurd? No questions, thank you. Um, I also have no questions. Uh, I just would ask Ms. Mulroney, um, I don't know if you um, were able to hear the a comment we had under the double poll uh, conversation initiated by the chairman, Mr. DeCourcy, and, and speaking about an upcoming meeting. Um, should try to get everybody together to sort of cycle this out. Um, okay, what was that in regards to? Uh, the double poll issue that we've, every time we've had the utilities come in, we started, the chair started back in um, October um, about really trying to address the double poll issue. And it's it's sort of a like the hot potato game. Um, and uh, we really wanna come to sort of a meeting of the minds and come to a, a working plan to actually start to address this, recognizing that we have the utility companies, the cable companies and national grid. Um, so that was discussed a couple of agenda items before you. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Okay, even though um, we're natural gas or in the ground. Oh, that's right, natural grid. I'm sorry, then you don't have to worry about that's double points. Right. And this is some of the ground I don't know about. I had a computer. No, I'm just one of the that you want to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a public hearing. Um, Mr. Chaplain, I'd like to open it up and ask if anyone from the public would like to speak. So there is one hand raised, um, uh, an abutter, Heidi Neck. And I see the name of another abutter who had reached out to me previously, uh, Mr. Romar. So if, if he is uh, listening and like to, would like to speak, he could raise his hand as well. But with your approval, Chair, I would um, I actually, if you're okay, I'll promote both Heidi and Mr. Romar to speak. Yes, please. And if um, we could start with Ms. Neck, um, if she's on or whoever comes on first. Yep, she is, yep. Hi, my name is Heidi Neck. I just abut the property at 292 Oakland. And I'm just curious, is this standard operating procedure? Is there anything I need to be worried about? Any safety issues? Um, you, you have the national grid or the um, board? Probably national grid is in a better position to answer this question. No, there'd, there'd be nothing to worry about. This is standard procedure all the time. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Does anyone else want to add to that, um, Mr. Chapterling? I do think Mr. Romar had a few questions. If I so, I would promote him. If that would just okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if he can just say his name and address for the record when he's on. Okay, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the board. We are abutters at 290 Oakland Avenue. We have no objection to the extension of the line. We simply had a, a several questions about how we would in be impacted while the construction takes place. For example, we'll be able to have access and egress from our driveway. The current line ends right at the middle of our driveway. So it would seem to me National Grid has to dig there and we're wondering about the um, access and egress, how that construction takes place. Second is, um, Will we be notified prior to construction so that we can prepare? Thirdly, will we have to have our gas appliances shut off for any duration? That would be an impact for us also. And that's pretty much the essence of our questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Romar. I guess I would ask Ms. Mulroney to speak to 
your three questions around access and egress during the construction project, um, notification during the project, and as well as your question regarding gas appliances, whether they need to be altered in any way. Ms. Moroni? Yes, um, Mr. Roma, um, National Grid, this is a small job, so it shouldn't take that long. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm erring on the side of caution, and I'm going to say um, two days, but I really believe that it's probably going to be one day. Um, and you would be accommodated, like if you need to get in and out of your driveway, the crew that is on the site um, will always make sure that, that you're notified as they go. And if you need to get out for an emergency or something, the, the crew will probably have plates there and, and will always make sure that you can get out of your driveway. And if they will notify you um, prior to the work, I'm gonna make that, um, put that in one of the notes. And um, as far as your appliances, no, um, you'd be, if they needed to, they'd get in touch with you, but no, you'll be fine. It will have no impact on anybody on the street. Thank okay, you. that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Roma. Um, I don't see any other hands from the public. So what I will do is to uh, motion to approve by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. I'll note that Mr. DeCourcy recused himself. Thank you. I still can't believe I brought double polls up to National Grid. Oh, that's the day I bet. Um, the next um, uh, double National Grid petition uh, is for Mass Act. Um, Ms. Maloney? Yes. Um, <clears throat> hi. National Grid resp re respectfully requests. Um, the town of Arlington to give us permission to go in. It's at 300 feet in all, but it's we're looking for 25 feet of six inch coated steel main extending from the six inch plastic main and mass Ave um, in Arlington. The main will be installed from mass Ave through the shared driveway and into the development property. Install 50 feet of four inch plastic to serve service to serve building number four within the development at 165 uh, Massachusetts Avenue, Arlington. Building four serves building one and building three to install approximately 50 feet of two inch plastic to serve buildings two with the development of 1165 Massachusetts Ave. Um, so it's like 300 feet in total, but a, a small section is in Mass Ave and the rest um, is on private property, a shared driveway. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start with Mr. Helmet. Thank you. Um, I will move approval subject to conditions, but I did want to reference the engineering reports note uh, for this property, uh, saying that the request wrongly identifies the grant of location for the entirety of the gas infrastructure required and advises select board to only consider the request for that portion of the gas main located within the public right of way. Uh, which is approximately 45 and it looks like there might have been a typo in the memo so it didn't continue the 45 um, but I, so I wanted to ask uh, perhaps the town manager if that's okay Ms. Ms. Chair um, for clarification on that. Certainly Mr. Chapley. Mr. Helmuth specifically asking if, if that's acceptable uh, in terms of yeah, yeah, if, I, if I'm understanding this correctly, and, and I think, um, and I apologize that I just didn't catch this before, shortly before the meeting, um, that um, if, if this is still a current recommendation, um, as far as you know, from, from the town engineer, that we only consider the request for the public, for the portion located within the public right away. Um, and then I guess my specific question is uh, just finishing the sentence, which says it is approximately 45, um, and then um, the, the memo leaves off uh, maybe it's feet or linear feet. I'm, I'm not sure what the what the figure is, and and, um, and I terrible for me to not see this be before and, and bring this up right on the, on the spot. But I think we need to get it, we need to get it right. So I I would have to consult with engineering to know what the remainder of that sentence is, whether it's 45 or 4500. I I don't 
No, as to, as to the first question, I would imagine that is still appropriate as I think we can only grant the, you know, yeah. can only, the board can only issue a grant of location for a private way and nothing, nothing else. Yeah, well, so it's a sort of, I think the, the typo probably doesn't matter then if we, um, and maybe, you know, if you or the town council have an opinion on this, but I think if I move that we, uh, we approve the, the, the portion of the guests may located within the public right of way, that would that be sufficient in this case? I believe it would be, um, Attorney Heim, do you think that's acceptable? So I'm sorry, Mr. Helmut, my understanding is that you want to limit the motion specifically so that the only thing that the board is approving is that which is clearly under its jurisdiction, the public way. That's right. I mean, I, I certainly don't have any objection to that. I don't know if National Grid has a position yeah, on that. Ask them next, yeah. Position on that, but, um, you know, you, you are the arbiters of certainly the public way. You're arbiters with respect to private ways with respect to certain things. Mm -hmm. And you did serve as the Board of Survey historically. Um, uh, but I'd be curious to see whether National Grid had any perspective on whether or not it's material that we vote on property mm -hmm. that isn't really uh, the towns uh, and what its experience with that has been. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I, I would uh, invite that as well, and just note that you know I'm I'm just responding to the advice um, from Mr. Schornard in the in the uh, in the memo. So um, yeah, uh, but if Mr. Nostrum has a view on on that, um, be glad to hear that now. Um, Ms. Melroney. Yes. Um. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. You go ahead. You get um, um, you want to know about the private driveway versus um, the opening um, extending like 25 probably to 45 feet. They probably erring on the side of caution with 45 feet um, of the public way. Is is that what you're asking? Yeah, I think I think our question is uh, the, the the town engineer recommended that um, no, noted that the request. Uh, identifies the grant of location for the entirety of the gas infrastructure. And just noted that the board only has jurisdiction over the public right away um, and advises that we should only consider the request for the portion of the gas main located within the public right away, which is about 45 feet, which is you know, what we can do. And um, just wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I, I'm gonna make the motion that we approve that within those, within the public right away, but to make sure that wasn't a, an unforeseen issue or concern you had about that? No, there shouldn't be because um, it, it's on a private driveway, a shared private driveway, and that would be up to the, the owners to deal with National Grid knowing that it's going down there. But um, it's, I, I always feel it's better to let you know, even though it was a small section of Mass Ave, yeah. I always like to include everything so that, that you know everybody has the, the general knowledge of it. But yes, no, it should be fine. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, so on that, yeah, I think I'll just repeat my motion to move approval subject to recommendations and conditions in the in the engineering memo and and with the further stipulation that this approval um, is for the public portion of the gas main located within the public right of way. Thank, Thank you, Mr. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, Mr. Hurd. You thank Mr. Helmuth for his diligence on his motion. Um, and I would like to second that. Um, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yes, there's nothing left to say on this one. I'm happy to approve. Um, for myself, um, ditto. Um, there's a public hearing um, at this time, if there are any, and I will note all the butters have been notified. Um, I guess I would ask the town manager, Mr. Chaplin, if anyone has indicated from the public they'd like to speak. Do not see any hands raised right now, Madam Chair. Okay, so with that on a uh, motion by Mr. Helmet, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mahan? Yes. It's a 4-0 vote with Mr. DeCourcy recusing himself. Great. And at this time, I will pass the gavel back to the chairman, um, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you. Th thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, we will now move Thank to you very much. 
we, we will now move to item agenda item eight, uh, American Rescue Plan Act investment in equity and outreach proposed expenditure plan and upper investment in water and sewer infrastructure proposed expenditure plan. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine will be presenting along with Jillian Harvey, the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Mr. Rademacher, um, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your, your timing worked out very well with saying their names as their faces appeared on screen. It was almost like we choreographed that. Um, so quickly before we dive into the details of each of these proposals, I did wanna take this opportunity to inform the board as well as the viewing public that last week, the final rule for ARPA was issued by Federal Treasury, uh, which was a multi hundred page document that in many ways we are still combing through, but there was a top line change of significant importance to Arlington and many cities and towns across the country. And that was a change from requiring us to justify a revenue loss to be able to use any ARPA funds for general fund benefit, shifting that to saying that cities and towns under a population of 250,000, which we qualify as, and with a grant total greater than 10 million, which we qualify as, can claim up to $10 million in revenue loss without justification. We had set aside, um, as you probably recall in the framework, $3 million for being able to claim revenue loss in case there was a change in the rule that would allow us to do so. Um, obviously this is a better result in terms of the support that we can provide to the general fund, though it will prompt um, me and I think others to want to revisit the framework to see where we could potentially reduce previously proposed investments to be able to increase benefit to the general fund. So there's more to come on that. I thought it was important to lead with that tonight uh, because, because of that fact, we'll only be asking for one discrete portion of the funds that were requested by Mr. Rademacher to give us a chance to do a deeper analysis um, as opposed to the entirety of the expenditures that were outlined in the water sewer memo. I would hope to be able to come back to the board by its next meeting in January or at the latest, its first meeting in February to bring forth um, either a recommended option or potentially even several options for a revised framework that would take this change into account. So before I talk a little bit about the equity audit and community outreach, any questions about that aspect? No, okay, thank you. So um, with that, why don't we start with the memorandum uh, and request that was put forth by, uh, by Jillian. And this is a continuation of what is now really the years of work that this town has committed to with an agenda around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I know the board is well aware of the multiple trainings that have been conducted by the National League of Cities for both the board and staff, and our goal of continuing those trainings into this new year to be able to move into the implementation of the utilization of a racial equity toolkit across all departments. Additionally, we've talked for quite a while about the need to develop an equity action plan. And I don't wanna speak for Jill, but I think what Jill has found in her work is that before being able to um, confidently and clearly execute or create an equity action plan, the best practice is to complete an equity audit for the organization. Um, and that is what uh, a big part of what we're asking for tonight is endorsing the use of these ARPA funds, in this case, $100,000 for, um, for the, to, to go out and find a consultant to conduct an equity audit in cooperation with town staff to be able to then create an equity action plan upon which we can act upon. Included within that request is also the funding for the duration of ARPA eligibility a $55,000 a year position for a community outreach liaison that can work directly with Jill in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to more fully reach out to our marginalized and most vulnerable populations 
in Arlington to truly be able to make sure that we are including all voices that need to be part of all of our efforts around DEI. So for this first year, we're asking for the approval of $100,000 for the equity audit and 55,000 for the position. And then in the future years, we would be asking for a continuing of the $55,000 for the community outreach position with further uh, requests to come for the expenditure of the balance of the funds as are outlined in the framework, likely for many aspects of implementing what the equity audit and equity action plan would call for. So with that, um, Jill, did I, did I miss anything? If I may, Mr. Chair? Certainly. No, I think you covered it. <laughs> um, I just want to say, if there's any questions or anything that needs clarification, I'm able to answer that. <laughs> but yeah, the idea is to get the audit done so that we can start to build out the framework. Um, and with that, I mean, I think we all know what our limitations are in outreach and communication. So this will be a huge help um, to ensure that we're making all that the town has to offer actually accessible to our community members. Um, thank you, Mr. Chaplin, and, and, and thank you, Ms. Harry. I think, Mr. Chaplin, what, what I'll do is I'll go through the board. We'll do um, Ms. Harvey's request first, and then we'll address Mr. Rodemarkers, but I'll, I'll go to the board now for questions or comments. But I want to thank Ms. Harvey for the detailed memorandum uh, outlining uh, the, the, the request, and that was included in our agenda package. Um, and I will turn to the board now for questions or comments, uh, starting with Mr. Diggins. I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to see this, Ms. Harvey. It, all, I mean, it just does everything that I would like to see something like this do. Beginning with the audit, because I often say, I mean, we can't tell whether we're doing something unless uh, we're having an effect unless we measure, I mean, and we have to get a baseline. So, so you're doing that, I mean, and, and the outreach um, um, and engagement coordinator, actually a, a member of Vision Arlington was asking me, you know, if um, we might be able to hire someone in that position. And, and I didn't know, and I hadn't really brought it up with the town manager. It was mad, really a matter of just trying to limit how much of his time that I take on Monday mornings. But I had reached out to a colleague, uh, well, not a colleague, but a fellow select board um, member in Brookline to ask them how their um, coordinator uh, was working out and and um she feels that the position is a good position to have i mean there there are some complications there but she thinks this is a good thing uh for for us to do and uh, uh i hope that we will be able to sustain this I mean um beyond the opera funds i mean i know that the you know, money is hard to come by uh in, in this town but i'll say this about spending in government we have to be careful about putting government on a starvation diet, I mean, and then having it underperform, I mean, and then have people say, well, why do we want to fund government when it doesn't do us any good? You know, so we really have to invest in government you know, in order to make it show, in order for it to show that it can really do good, I mean, for, 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 the, the, for the public, because in the end, government is us. I mean, and, and so, so um, I'm so thrilled to see this and I hope that the person, whoever it is, will come to one of the um, civic engagement group meetings at some point in time. You know, so so um, uh, I think since we've approved the framework, you don't really need a motion to, to approve anything. I'll move motion to receive, but whatever you want me to approve, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, Mr. Diggins, I, I think that Mr. Chapterlane and Ms. Harvey are looking for a motion for endorsement of the expenditure. So if, if you are so inclined, if you want to move to endorse the, the expenditures, that's that's what we would uh, look to do tonight. I'm happy to move to endorse the expenditures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you. I'd like to strongly enthusiastically echo everything my colleague, Mr. Diggins, just said. Um, you know, that you, we have to start with talking the talk, and we, we do that. This is really walking the walk. Uh, and I know, Ms. Harvey, when we, when we spoke this summer uh, about your goals for, for Arlington, and you talked a lot about this equity audit that you really wanted, I am beyond thrilled that we have the resources to do it. Um, and I know we talked at length about the action, equity action plan that you want us to, to work on that, that will flow from this. Um, this is the real work. This is, this is the hard work of, of equity. I think that we will learn some things from this audit that are 
challenging and are difficult. And we need to confront those things with, with an open heart and with, with, an op with open eyes and with new ways of understanding. We need to listen. I think this will be a really good tool for that. I was glad in your memo that you started out by talking about the pandemic. It, you know, it has shown us that you know, we are all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. We have different boats. It has been a lot harder for some people than others. The impacts have been far greater. And you're absolutely right that the pandemic has really laid bare the inequities that have always been there and are worse. So, so thank you for your, your vision and connecting those dots as you always do. And I am really excited to see what we learn and even more excited to see what opportunities we identify to do the really hard work, the really effective work that will uh, help everyone in this town feel like they are part of the town, that they have a voice in the government, that they have a place at the table. Um, so, so thanks. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Ms. Harvey and Mr. Chapterlane for your presentation and your short and long range sort of vision on this and, and where it's going to go. And I, just for clarity's sake, we're endorsing the $100,000 study, and we're also endorsing the position at 55,000 times three. It's not 55,000 one time, <laughs> just for housekeeping, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Happy to support, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan for that clarification too uh, on, on the time periods. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Harvey for the memo and all your work on this. Um, I'm happy to support this. I know we've been talking about the equity audit for what seems like years now, I don't think it's been that long, but it's something that you know has been at the forefront of our discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion as the first step to get us where we need to be. Um, so um, it's good to see, be able to use the federal funds to do it. We do it anyways, but to have an avenue to do this with the ARPA funds, I think is a really good use of the funds. And I know you have a lot on your plate, so I'm happy to support the, the uh, adding someone to take a little of that off your plate and uh, help you get through this. So I appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, and I wanna echo my colleagues, um, Ms. Harvey, and thank you for your vision and for, for putting this um, before us. And I, I am happy to support this and, and look forward to the to the results and, and uh, in doing, doing the work that uh, walking the walk, as Mr. Helma said, uh, as we go forward. So, so thank you for this. And um, so in a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth for endorsement of the proposed expenditures, uh, Attorney Heim. Heard? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Do you have vote? Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I will now turn to the second half of the uh, presentation this evening, which is the water and sewer infrastructure proposed expenditure. Um, Mr. Chaplin, did you want to go through the, I, th I think it might be one particular item this evening or Mr. Rademacher, whoever would like to present that. So I, I will I'll give a, a brief uh, overview and then I think Mr. Rademacher can certainly answer any detailed questions the board might have. So the board, um, the board will recall that one of the first votes it ever took in regards to ARPA was approving $1.6 million in water sewer infrastructure spending for the water meter reading system. So that's already been put in place, but that is part and parcel with our ongoing water meter replacement program. So there is one item that's listed in the memo that Mr. Rademacher put together listed as water meter replacement. Um, and there's two sums in there, one for 405,000 and one for 337,000, which I think adds up to 742,000. And Mr. Rodemarker and I talked about this today, um, though I think he would love to have it all approved tonight. Um, he understands the sort of reanalysis that we need to do based on the federal rule, but in order to move forward with um, the water meter reading system and to bring to completion this water meter replacement program, 
we're both very hopeful that we can ask for the board's endorsement of that additional $742,000 expenditure on top of the 1.6 million that had been previously approved by the board. The only thing I would add to that is in the scenarios that I've already run in looking at how we would get to the $10 million for claiming revenue loss within the ARPA framework, this expenditure, the 1.6 plus the 742,000 works well within that without inhibiting our ability to get to the $10 million figure. So we'd ask for your favorable, um, again, your, your, your endorsement of that request tonight. And again, Mr. Rademacher can answer any detailed questions about the program. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. And, and thank you, Mr. Rademacher for the, the detailed memorandum and, and the way things shifted last week. I, I, I know, you know, while good news for the general fund, um, it's gonna create some challenges in terms of the timing on water and sewer projects. And uh, we wanna work with you on that, but thank you for your, uh, for your patience on that. Um, did you want to add anything to what the manager said, or, or I can turn it over to board members at this point? Uh, no, Mr. Chapelain covered it uh, very well, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, I will turn to the board, uh, Mr. Helmut. Thank you. Uh, happy to make a motion to uh, endorse the town manager's recommendation, um, or endorse to, re of the, to endorse the um, the expenditure for the water meter replacements. Um, and you know, I appreciate the. Um, the carefulness of the thought by by uh, the town manager and his staff in reacting to to the the final rule for ARPA, and I think that it is appropriate appropriate caution right now to to, to do this because we have a short term need to to get this project done uh, given our exposure with the technology, um, but but to take a step back and, and look at the rest. So so I appreciate that. No other questions. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll gladly second that. Um, I do have just one question, sort of clarification question, um, and that's on the um, private sewer inflow removal. Um, obviously, that's talking about property, not that the town owns, but basement sump pumps of residents. Correct. Uh, yes, for the majority, yes. Okay, and I'm, I'm just thinking of all way. East Arlington abutting um, the Al Life. Um, what exactly is the two hundred thousand for? So we have um, we have been tasked by the DEP to have um, anybody's private property sump pumps that are connected to sewers uh, in the house to be removed. Um, sump pumps that run during a storm that discharge to a sewer often uh, exacerbate the issue of um, sewage overflow. Uh, into um, streams. So we're tasked with working to remove that overflow and it, it can sometimes be daunting for residents to, um, to handle all those costs on, uh, on them, their own. Sometimes these are issues they got when they bought a house that they didn't create these problems and so forth and so on. So we have a database of where we believe these connections exist and we're gonna be looking to assist residents in um, disconnecting these sources of um, uh, uh, some pumps to sewers, but we, we were hoping to be able to offer some financial assistance in doing so. That's great. I was hoping that it wasn't sort of 200,000 to enforce and um, all these either long time residents or brand new residents are faced with um, a cost that they hadn't built in there. And, and it's good, you know, in some cases could be very uh, expensive. So this would more or less just be to set up a program. Um, if it's just 200,000, I'd be happy, but um, I'll leave that to you in um, your uh, department. Uh, but I think you may have to revis revisit that, but um, we'll see. So I just wanted to make sure that 200,000 wasn't just to enforce and say, we got to yank this out of here go deal with it. I'm very um, pleased to hear that, especially since I think most, if not all of this really applies to um, East Arlington. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have no questions. Happy to support it. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, and I'm happy to support this as well. Um, so a motion by Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, oh. Did I miss you, Mr. Diggins? I'm you sorry. Did. You did. I, and, and I want to express my. No, my no, no. Sorry, wait, wait, wait. Mr. Diggins, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, 
I got I split the vote here and, and I had you going first. So I didn't get back to you here. My apologies. That's no okay. I, I got national grid with double pull, so I think I did better than you. Sorry, Mr. Biggins. No problem, no problem. I'm, I'm actually very happy to see Mr. Rodebacher too. I don't want him to feel that I'm only enthusiastic about, you know, uh, equity audits, you know. Uh, I mean, the great part about being a part of the, the board is that I get to learn a lot of stuff. I mean, and, and I learn enough that I actually really care about uh, about this. And, and actually, um, uh, my colleague, Ms. Um, Mrs. Mahan, I mean, uh, brought up a question that I was interested in too. So so we disconnected some pumps from the sewer. Where, the, where does the outflow go at that point? We're developing different options to suit different situations. So sometimes it might just go to a backyard. Sometimes it might go to a, a, a like a, a dry well installed in the yard, or in some occasions we'll let residents connect to our storm drain system, right. and right. not sewer system. Okay. Well, well then. So if the 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 Goal of disconnecting it from the sewer system is to stop the sewer overflow situation. And the problem we have is a combined stormwater. The town, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the town does not have a combined system. We have two separate systems. Okay, so then we're not part of the problem, is what you no. Okay. So then if we're not part, of, I guess what I'm confused about then is that. So, so the reason for disconnecting the sumps is so that it doesn't go into a sewer and then be a part of a problem, but then we're not part of a problem? Well, so we do not have a combined system within the street. Our storm drain and our sewers are separate within the street. Um, what can be a problem is when a sump pump in someone's basement or private property is connected to the sewer and they are um, adding clean water at a high rate to a, store, uh, a sewer system that isn't designed for that level of inflow. So then when those sewer pipes are inundated with clean water, they start to back up and you won't get necessarily sewage backing out into streams, but maybe coming out of a manhole in a street and then running down the street into a catch basin and then finding its way into a, a stream or whatnot. So we are looking to remove clean water from sewer pipes so that those sewer pipes can flow as designed and not be inundated. Um, but the town itself does not have a combined drainage and, uh, and sewer system that overflows during heavy rains because they're combined. They sometimes overflow because like this, these private inflow sources of storm drains uh, of uh, sump pumps are connected. And those are something we can, we can re rectify. Great, thank you. We, you know, whether I'm smarter or not, I certainly feel smarter after this. So thank you once again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Diggins, and, and I'm, I'm sorry for the uh, for the mix up there. Um, so on a motion uh, by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Um, yes, and hopefully we can get DEP to do the same with the CSO discharges in the outlife, but I know we'll be discussing that again in the future. Thank you. Um, Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. To unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Next is open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, is anybody who wishes to speak uh, for open forum? There's currently two hands raised, Mr. Chair, three hands raised now. Winnell Evans is the first hand. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Evans. Mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, Maybe. terrific. I, before I begin, I would like to please beg your indulgence for an additional 30 seconds. I have rehearsed and rehearsed, and I cannot get my remarks below three minutes and 30 seconds. So if that would be okay, I would be very, very grateful. 
And I usually have a soft three minutes. So why don't you go ahead? And if it All right. feels like you're getting to a good spot, we, will, uh, we won't take a close look at the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, Winnell Evans, Orchard Place. Good evening, everybody. I want to speak about one affordable housing strategy of the draft housing production plan, which this board will be reviewing at the end of this month. And this is to allow two family homes in all residential districts by right. The intent of this upzoning is to help Arlington increase its supply of homes, quote, with a housing type that has traditionally been part of the town's residential landscape, and also to introduce a modest missing middle effort that is compatible with detached single family homes, unquote. The traditional housing type referred to here is rentals in one or both units of two family homes, but we're actually seeing an increased loss of these rental options and the disappearance of housing for the missing middle as new market rate condo duplexes replace our single and two family housing. Additionally, there is much research that shows that upzoning actually drives up prices. Alan Arthur, president and CEO of a nonprofit affordable developer in Minneapolis, where fourplexes by right were recently allowed, says, the comment that building housing alone will automatically fix affordable housing problems is absolutely false. You'd have to overbuild for a long period of time. The focus should go to preserving existing affordable housing units, which is much cheaper. Churches United for Fair Housing has found that, quote, rezonings are so sure to pass and so sure to be beneficial to developers that even the announcement of a review process leads to rampant speculation, unquote. Michael Storper at the London School of Economics has studied upzoning effects extensively and says that, quote, upzoning allows for market speculation to dominate. Skilled people with high incomes are going to move into upzoned neighborhoods and crowd out the middle and lower income people who are living there. This is how blanket upzoning produces the consequence of displacement, exactly the opposite of what the authors of upzoning bills claim they want to produce, unquote. An MIT study of upzoning in Chicago over a five-year period found that, quote, upzoning in hot neighborhoods sends a strong signal to the developer community that there is a big market for luxury housing. Property owners wishing to sell get the same signal and begin the process of bidding up sales prices. And a study from the Urban Displacement Project at Berkeley found that, quote, because market mechanisms work differently at different geographic scales, at the regional scale, the interaction of supply and demand determines prices and producing more market rate housing will result in decreased housing prices and reduced displacement pressures. But at the local neighborhood scale, new luxury buildings send signals to the market that such neighborhoods are desirable for wealthier residents, resulting in new demand. By extension, one would expect market rate development to increase displacement at the local neighborhood scale. The materials Don Seltzer and I emailed to you all last week show that these effects are well underway here as R2 conversions take place. R2 conversions are de facto upzoning, and rather than providing options for the missing middle, they are instead removing options from them. I respectfully ask you to keep this consequence in mind as you consider whether to adopt the finalized housing production plan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you for letting me run over. Thank you, Ms. Evans. The next hand raised is Lynette Culverhouse. Good evening, Ms. Culverhouse. Just need to unmute yourself. My name is Lynette Culverhouse. I'm a resident on Draper Avenue and a town meeting member in Precinct 11. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Ms. Harvey for putting together the DEI audit and the board for supporting it. It's a good start to doing the hard work of making Arlington more equitable and inclusive. 
On a related matter, I was a signer on the letter sent to the select board last week regarding the BLM banner. There were 81 other signers to this letter, 32 of whom are town meeting members. It is very disappointing to see that it's not on the agenda tonight and that this matter is not resolved before the Martin Luther King Day. Town meeting overwhelmingly voted to display the banner in town. And it's hard to understand why it's not been done yet, a whole year later. All I'm asking this board to do is not to ignore this unresolved issue and the people who so strongly support hanging the banner. There is huge support for displaying the banner in town and we owe it to each other to publicly proclaim our stated commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion by honoring the vote made by town meeting. I hope to see this on the select board's next agenda, and I would be happy to discuss this with any board member who wants to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Calvaros. The next speaker is Elizabeth Trey. Good evening, Ms. Dre. Good evening. Elizabeth Dre, town meeting member, precinct eight. I'd also like to congratulate the board and Ms. Harvey on the vote taken tonight uh, to support the equity audit and the, uh, the position of the community outreach liaison. It's, it's very exciting news. And thank you for that work. Um, as we approach the celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black and Black History Month, I ask the board to acknowledge the letter from the community members submitted last week and attached to tonight's agenda, asking you to resume and complete your discussion related to the Black Lives Matter banner tonight and to heed town meetings unequivocal vote regarding return of the banner to town hall. Since July of last year, on four different occasions, town leadership has publicly committed to work with the Human Rights Commission, the DEI coordinator and community stakeholders to determine how, where, and when a banner or a similar message could be displayed in Arlington and to develop a policy to define how the town hall space should be used for banner display. That's four times. And four times there has been no follow through on those commitments. Over a year ago on January 4th, then Chairman Hurd stated some of the last words that have been spoken on this issue by the select board by urging fellow select board members to act. He said, we made a decision to go through our special town meeting, let them weigh in on the subject, and then we would consider the vote of town meeting among other competing aspects of the situation that we had to consider. It is incumbent upon us now to come up with a plan. And later he said, we should resolve it at the next meeting, if not tonight. And that was over a year ago. And since then, there has been no discussion. You may remember the September 2020 discussion about putting up a different sign so that everyone who entered town hall would clearly understand the full breadth of the town's commitment to equity beyond Black Lives Matter. The select board unanimously voted to ask the town manager to display the section of Title II, Article 9, Section 2, Subsection C of the bylaw regarding protected classes so that it would greet all people who enter the town hall. Originally, there was a large sign attached to the construction fence. But today, I went to the town hall to look. And here, I found it on a 9 by 11 piece of paper taped to two seldom used side doors to the side of the main entrance. And in my opinion, this does not take the place of a Black Lives Matter banner hanging on town hall. The letter submitted has been signed by over 80 residents, including 34 town meeting members. It's an effort to hold the select board accountable to the unfulfilled commitments that you have made to residents. The letter asked you to add the Black Lives Matter to a banner to tonight's agenda for discussion and to vote to rehang the banner on town hall. Thus proudly and unequivocally reaffirming that Black Lives Matter today and every day in Arlington. And while you chose not to do that, I urge you to do so at your next meeting. And finishing up on a separate note, I wanted to say I'm disappointed to see that in the public participation section of the select board handbook, the use of the word citizen instead of resident and the ask that people continue to share their address to speak, both exclude and discourage residents from participating as is their right. This language was informally done away with under Chair Hurd's tenure, and I would love to see that reflected permanently in the handbook. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Ray. 
The final hand raised is Don Seltzer. Good evening, Mr. Seltzer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I would like to speak to the board about the housing production plan. I've submitted detailed comments to the board about the shortcomings of the consultant's report. I hope you will find time to compare this report against the state guidelines of what should be in a housing plan. State guidelines require that the plan evaluate the impact of future housing growth on school capacity. Our previous housing plan devoted four pages to this analysis. This draft report has but a single paragraph which dismisses capacity as being of no concern based solely upon the 2015 McKibben forecast. However, that 2015 forecast made no assumptions about housing growth nor changing family demographics demographics stemming from new denser housing. The recent census shows that Arlington's population is growing far faster than McKibben predicted. We already have reached a population that McKibben predicted we would not see until the next decade. Please consider this rule of thumb. For every 80 housing units that we add, expect to fill up another classroom. I asked the board, where will we build our next school and where will we find the $55 million to pay for it? Another failing of this plan is the recommendation to encourage the replacement of single family homes with two families and duplexes. The report's author has been quite candid that this is not about affordability. It is about providing more choice to upper income families who can afford to spend 1 million or more on a home, households making more than 200% of AMI, well out of the scope of what state guidelines say a housing plan should be covering. This board has been provided with dozens of examples of recent conversions in which single family homes were replaced with condo duplexes for which each unit was more expensive than the original home. The residents most affected are the one third of Arlington households that have an income of between 100K and 200K. This includes many of our first responders and two income teacher households. For this middle third, smaller older homes that range from 600K to 800K are attainable, but this housing plan attacks that existing moderately affordable housing base by encouraging teardown and replacement with more expensive duplex condos. The middle third of Arlington is slowly being squeezed out by eliminating the home ownership that is within their means. I hope that this board will make the appropriate revisions to this draft plan prior to approving it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. There are no additional hands, Mr. Chair. All right, um, that ends open forum for this evening. Uh, I will move on to traffic rules and orders, other business, item nine for discussion and approval, all alcohol license regulations changes, Ali Carter, Economic Development Coordinator. Ali is here and should be joining us in just a second. Good evening, Ms. Carter. Good evening, thank you. Allie Carter, Economic Development Coordinator. Great. Um, and thank, thank you, we, we, we got a version of the proposed changes, but if you could walk us through those changes and then we'll I'll turn to the board for any questions or comments. Sure, and thank you for the feedback. The last time I came to the board, um, we uh, I took your feedback, brought it back to some, of um, my peers in town um, in the legal department, in the select board office, um, and in the Department of Health and Human Services and the Arlington Police Department. Um, so this revision that you see marked up here is a result of review from all those departments in addition to um, the folks who looked at it before. Um, the pages, you know, they basically, the goal, um, as stated before, was 
just to add a little bit more flexibility to the types of establishments that can open and serve alcohol with these licenses. Um, so on page three, there's just some language to um, state that um, brewery licenses are allowed by this in addition to holders of common victualler licenses. Um, and again, on page four, just a simple addition of brewery license language. This is um, a request that we get fairly often and just people have a hard time finding um, a space big enough to accommodate breweries. But at this current point in time, there are three different parties looking to open breweries in town. And two of these parties have at least one Arlington resident on their team. So it's this really is responsive to um, active requests from entrepreneurs. Um, sorry, returning to the document here. Um, no suggested revisions on page page five or six. Um, it does, I think the most substantive changes are um, in the physical plant section, um, section D, um, which mostly relates to um, signage um, and marketing of alcoholic beverages. And we wanted to tie in um, the section 6.2 of the zoning bylaw, um, but also change the language to allow that um, if someone opened a brewery, they could have signage for their own product, but not that a restaurant could or other type of establishment could just have posters or signage for different brands of alcohol. Um, section E um, allows for um, not just wait staff, but counter staff to serve um, alcohol at a point of sale. Um, this again would just allow more flexibility for the type of service and the type of food service business that could open in town. And then um, in alignment with other goals that the town has, we wanted to be a little more flexible with um, recyclable and compostable materials with the service of food um, and not just silverware. But we also wanted to clarify that we discouraged, you know, paper plates, disposable items, plastic was not what we were looking for, um, but durable materials that could be reused. And um, the final item was just, uh, I think we went back and forth about this quite a bit, the origin of um, related to outdoor dining and alcohol service, there was um, a, the last sentence of, excuse me, let me back up. It's the second to last line on page seven before the beginning of section four um, stated that all outdoor food and alcohol service shall conclude before 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday. Um, I'm sorry, Thursday through Sunday, which corresponded to the weekend and didn't seem to make as much sense as if it said Sunday through Thursday. So after checking and double checking that line with um, many peers, um, we reverse those days. So that's a summary of the specific changes. And um, I hope that wasn't too much detail, but I did want to cover it all. So I'm happy to take any questions anyone has. No, thank you for the explanation on, on the various items. Um, I'll turn to the board, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Carter. For First of all, it's nice to see you on the, the north side of 11 o'clock. Um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> we've certainly, uh, you've, you've stood the test of time with your stamina. Um, it definitely went through that. I Am I to assume, I know we had a conversation about first, second, third offense, um, the language there. Um, I think we, we spoke about it and we were gonna check on it to make sure that that's sort of in concert with um, other cities and towns, other penalties. So I take it that there's no red line there that that's okay to stay the way it was. Yes, correct. 
Okay. And um, I, I just want to clarify, because I'm just imagining some um, possible restaurant managers or the like, uh, when we're talking about the number of alcohol, alcoholic beverages, can you text right now, um, in terms of serving food, uh, it, it does say in there, uh, it's not necessarily a mandate that you have to use disposable, recyclable, you can use solid, correct? Yes, correct. But with the goal of, you know, moving forward, um, I'm just like, you know, I can imagine going in, I'm going to get beat up down at Gillian's about straws, paper straws versus silicone versus the, give me the good old plastic. So I want to get my donut straw. So I just want to be able to say that but also tell people to be mindful of the future as we move forward, that may be ultimately where they where we go, but that, that's still open enough. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, until Gail Lands starts serving alcohol, I think they'll be okay with their current oh, no, they'll, they'll still ask me, I, I still get asked about paper straws. <laughs> I need alcohol afterwards, but that doesn't mean, but, um, but no, I'm just thinking of, you know, restaurants and peace. sometimes people focus in on one thing um, and I just want to be able to provide the correct information. So I, I do thank you for all your hard work on this and putting up with us um, at an earlier hour as you have at a later hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Carter, for the presentation. I'm happy to second the motion. And I, I don't know where they put a brewery in Arlington right now, but if they can squeeze it in, I look forward to going to it. I think there'd be a good market for it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Common ground, Mr. Hurd. They put it in common ground. I think that's a good space. You know, you know I bet if I said, we, I don't look, I don't smoke pot, you know, in support of a pot place. People go, yeah, right, you know. And if I say I don't drink, you know, uh, they go, huh. Uh, but but I don't do either because I'm a lightweight, you know, and trust me, the world is better off because we just don't need a less inhibited blend. Uh, I am really happy uh, to see this, you know, um, especially the the brewery part. I mean, it you know, uh, it's um. Yeah, it's exciting. I hope I hope that works out uh, someplace, whether Common Ground or any other place. I mean, and I'm also happy to see the relaxation of um, parking requirements because I mean, uh, I think that will make it easier on some businesses and also kind of support our whole notion of um, of um, of active transportation. Which you know, when you think about it, when people go to drink, should they really be getting in a car? And driving anyways maybe some have someone come and pick them up but anyways this is really good work um miss carter and um not only am i happy to see you before 11 o'clock i'm happy to see you in january at all good luck with everything all right look forward to seeing you when you're, you know thank you thank you mr diggins uh, mr helmuth uh, thank you thank you miss carter for your work on this and especially for uh, for doing the the, the good luck work with your colleagues in other departments. Um, I know I checked in with Health and Human Services um, about this in past weeks, and I know that you've worked together with them to address concerns they had. And you know, it's important to get this right. I think the the uh, economic benefit to our businesses is really important, but it's also really important that we continue our really good practices of effective alcohol control policy. Not not only to protect underage youth, but also to encourage responsible alcohol service and um, and, um, and and such, so so I appreciate that. I do have two questions, uh, mm -hmm. just to help me understand the the intent of a couple of things. And both of these are in page seven, in section E. Um, I, I think it's a good idea to add the the driver's license verification at the point of sale to confirm drinking age, and also the customer is the sole recipient of the beverage. And my question is. Um, because it's just, just I just don't know how this works. How does somebody at the point of sale con with that ID confirm that the customer is going to be the one who drinks the beverage? They would have to hand it off to them at that time. It, it would be sort of like a uh, check, verify. And we went over this a lot, Natasha and I. They would um, have to look at the license, identify the person, and then hand that person whose license it is that beverage. Mm -hmm. um, as they proceed to sit, um, 
you know, additional controls could happen, but at the point of sale is basically, you know, additional monitoring can happen. There's mm -hmm. always, you know, some room for error, but we really wanted to focus on that. The person who gets handed the drink mm -hmm. is the person whose license is presented. Yeah, good. Yeah, no, the handoff makes sense. And um, I mean, I, I obviously what we're trying to avoid is straw purchases for particularly for minors or people under under underage. Are there and are there other regulations in place that that prohibit that anyway? Hmm. That's probably a better question for the health department, actually. Um, I, you know, I, th I think there are, but I think I think what you're getting at is that there are other controls that you know that we can look at or other other server training and policy that that would address that. Yeah, the customer. I I think that the customer is the sole recipient of the beverage. I with that specific language, mm -hmm. I, it's not quite so explicit. But what we were trying to get at was that it's a one to one transaction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That yeah that one person sense. orders one drink, and mm -hmm. that's what they walk off with. Um, yep. and that you can yeah. get a tray or a pitcher or yeah. more than one beverage. No, that yeah. actually does make sense, right? Yeah. Okay. No, that that's that's plenty clear. Thank you, and thanks for including okay. my understanding about that. Um, and the second thing is just the paragraph below that. Um, it, um, I noticed that the, the food being served on either solid, reusable, recycled, or compostable, but doesn't we've eliminated any reference to beverages. So was was there an intent to exempt uh, beverages from uh, from those categories, um, which which I think could have the effect of of newly allowing beverages to be served in disposable glassware. Sorry, I just want to read it again. So that the, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll explain the, the point we were trying to make with the food yeah. service was just to be um, a little bit more flexible and accommodating. Again, it, it kind of relates back to the type of establishment that would serve you the drink over the counter. That's mm -hmm. more like not a fast food. I really want to say not fast food, but like a fast casual type establishment where you mm -hmm. would get your you can get alcohol typically at these places, but you can also order food that comes like on um, on a metal tray that has um, wax paper at the bottom or um, a, perhaps a plastic red basket that's again lined with wax paper so that the materials are reusable, but it's a little bit more of a casual establishment and not necessarily like a silverware white mm -hmm. tablecloth type of restaurant. Would, would there be any problem with with um, just adding food and beverages must be served on solid, reusable, recyclable, compostable dinnerware so that we don't have a loophole there for, for the beverages themselves? So I think that would go, I really enjoy this type of thing, by the way, this wordsmithing. So I think um, because section, uh, so E2, that is service of food, but E1 with service of alcoholic beverages. Mm. Um, yeah, that's that's a fair point, yeah. We, we, could, we could, if we wanted to add a similar mm -hmm. uh, sentence, it would go in that section. Yeah. I, you know, I'll see, I'll see, I, don't, I don't feel super strongly point about it. I mostly want to make sure that, you know, there was that was uh, since we were changing some of the categories and I'm thinking mostly at this point, just the environmental um, uh, sustainability implications for this, that there, if there's an opportunity to, to deal with that, but if that's, if that's kind of something that could have been raised, you know, earlier and gotten gone into this, I'm happy to let this, you know, to support this as it is now. And if we want to possibly revisit that as part of another larger sustainability conversation, um, no, that's fine with me too. Um, mostly really, I just wanted to understand kind of what, what the intent was. Yeah, and it, it was it was a lot about the type of establishment, but also yeah. tying in those other goals. Yeah. Um, I think we could, <clears throat> and to be to be fair, I'm not like fully versed on the food code the way my um, colleagues in the health and human services department are, so it could sit somewhere else. But I could also see that basically, a the last sentence of E two as kind of amended could mm -hmm. say instead of food must be served on beverages must be served in 
Right. Yeah. And drinkware instead of dinnerware. Yeah, um, but you know, I, th I think my instinct is to let it stand as it is now, just just so that we don't unintentionally do do, do something, you know, in in this moment that that has complications that we haven't thought about. Maybe just as a as a bookmark to to potentially look at that later, because we could always add that revision um, in a later time if it makes. I think it makes sense from a sustainability point of view to really look at that with the beverage containers, but probably not to try to monkey with it too much here. So. Uh, but that that's it. Th uh, thanks. I, I appreciate the discussion because it helps me understand what we're trying to do here and what the scope of these these changes are. Sure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, yeah, and I also want to thank you again, Ms. Carter, for the, the explanation and for the changes here. One question on, on that page seven on the service of food. And again, I support this. I don't know if it's something that we may have to look into or you may have to look into later. It, to the extent that you do have a brewery or a beer garden type operation, you know a number of them um, have food trucks, and and so the, the the food is actually being serviced through. It's almost like a joint venture from the food trucks that might come on site. And just a question if this would be broad enough to to cover that situation if it ever comes. It's a hypothetical, and it's it is you know I guess it depends on how broad the definition of area is uh, for for alcohol being served, but. Uh, I guess we'll worry about that uh, when the interest comes in. I, I think in terms of the alcohol regulations, this would work for that because I was trying to think of that scenario. The other set of rules that would have to be amended, I believe, to accommodate that would be the traffic rules and orders. Um, there is language in there about um, any sort of vending that happens from a vehicle has to be continuous. And if it is discontinued for a period of 10 minutes or more, they have to keep it moving. And so I haven't quite tackled that piece yet, um, but that would be, I think, a next step to consider. Okay, all right, good, uh, thank you. Um, so as I said, I support this as well. And uh, on the approval, of the all alcohol license regulations changes, a uh, motion made by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Thank you all so much. Have a nice night. You too. Okay, item 10 um, is a presentation discussion and vote on marijuana establishment host community agreement license applicant, Calix Peak of Massachusetts. Um, I want to announce it's, it's, it's near nine o'clock. We have a few items left. Would members like a five minute break before we start the hearing? Um, okay, why don't we do that? And we can bring the Calix Peak or, or arrange for them to come join us. But why don't we start that in five minutes? Um, so we are now on item 10, uh, is a, it just announced the presentation, discussion, and vote, marijuana establishment, host community agreement, license applicant, Calix Peak of Massachusetts. There are a number of people here from Calix Peak. I see attorney O'Connor is here uh, representing them. So um, if you want to introduce yourselves and um, we have, if, let me step back for one second. We have um, three host community agreements that we can enter into in Arlington. We have it entered into two. Uh, last fall, we sent out a notification for expressions of interest. Calix Peak was the only organization that responded. And um, I've been trying to coordinate with uh, Attorney O'Connor for the hearing date. And tonight is the, uh, the night that we're gonna go forward with it. Um, so I'll turn it to Attorney O'Connor and then um, can introduce the team and, and make the presentation. And we'll have questions from the board members uh, as we go along. Thank you, Chairman DeCourcy, and uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, I represent Calix Peak, and this evening, um, Aaron Car Caracillo is the CEO of Calix Peak is on the call. We have Pete D'Agostino from 10X, one of the consultants, and Dan Linsky, who I believe is in charge of security um, for Calix Peak. Uh, you have an extensive application and uh, uh, project information from Calix Peak. They have been in front of your board previously uh, for a host community agreement. Um, Calix, I will give you a very brief overview. 
Calix Peak is a very experienced man in the management and administration of retail adult marijuana use. It is a well capitalized company. And I will to be charitable with respect to the site, which is 251 Summer Street, Arlington, will say that it'll take a tired looking site and significantly improve it with a 3000 square foot building and 7000 um, square feet of parking. Uh, you also should have a memorandum dated November 23rd, 2021 from the Marijuana Study Group. And I believe Mr. Diggins was the uh, select board representative on that uh, study group. And um, the uh, study group determined that this proposed project is not anticipated to have a significant impact on safety and operations on Summer Street or the surrounding roadways. There were um, a couple of issues raised. One of them was um, a more detailed ingress and egress plan and a question of whether there would be drilling versus blasting when the new, when what is there, as everybody who lives in town knows this is the old Getty gas station, um, is to be demolished. Those issues, I would suggest to you, would be better vetted in front of, if, if the host community agreement is allowed, in front of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Another issue raised was the status of the 21E at that site. There was a clean 21E for that property. Um, and the Arlington Police Department representative on this uh, committee noted that the experience with Apotheca in the Heights has been a positive one. And for those of you who are in the Heights, I'm in the Heights several times a week, you wouldn't even know Apotheca was there. Um, uh, so I would point out that in 2016, the voters in Massachusetts approved the legalization of recreational adult marijuana use by 53%. Arlington's vote was 57%. Uh, we, you have the opportunity to approve this host community agreement with a top rate company, take a B4 site, which is a vehicular oriented site. And the zoning bylaw specifically says when the town has the ability to take an, a vehicular oriented site and take it, make it some other use, they should try to do that. And provide the town with a revenue stream here from the impact fee and I would also suggest to you that the renovation and improvements on this property will significantly increase the property value and the property taxes. So I'd like to turn it, unless you have any questions of me, I would like to turn it over to Aaron, who will go through the proposal. Yeah, I'd go, go right ahead. Aaron, I think you're muted. I apologize. Um, I'm going to share my screen with the presentation, if you don't mind. Um, and I want to thank you guys tonight for taking the time to meet with us. Um, I really appreciate it. I believe most of you, as Mary O'Connor said, have reviewed this proposal at length. Um, so I'm going to go through this really quickly because I know it's 50 slides and we've been on here for a long time this evening. So in the uh, interest of everyone's time on this call, um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Aaron Crotchlow. I am the CEO. I was appointed in December of 2020. I believe in the past year I've met with one of my former colleagues. Um, I have an extensive background in retail. I've been in retail for 20 plus years. My original background is finance. I am an accountant slash auditor. I came out of public accounting and was there for four years before I delved into the retail world. So with that, um, I wanted to kick off kind of the location. As Mary noted, um, the plan is to obviously Obviously, it's to tear down the current facility. Um, we're going to review keeping the facility and adding on, uh, but it may be a complete demolition once we get a local architect in there to see what we could do. Um, the image that I'm showing here currently is what we're building in Swampscott, and this is going to be kicked off in April. And this also was, this was a teardown. So this was a building that was like an old bodega slash liquor store. Um, and we tore it to the ground and basically put up this new building. So. Ideally, this is the aesthetic we're going for, but we would work with local architecture, architectures in town to ensure that it fits the neighborhood. Um, since our last time that we met with you guys, we have signed an HCA in Worcester, um, and we're starting to build that out in early 2022. And as just noted, we've already started our demolition in Swampscott um, with a go live date. It says here in March, it's probably gonna be closer to April um, given just the weather and the time of year. Uh, additionally, we are already working. Our parking lot is shared with the veterans. 
So we are currently working with the veterans to do some events with them, whether it be for Veterans Day, Memorial Day, anything like that. Um, I've already started participating in local events with them. They had one in, in September that I actually personally went to and uh, donated. So it's for me extremely important as you know, earlier in this presentation, you guys mentioned the Sadler and things that Mr. Trumblow are looking to do. And to me, that's a huge win. I am the daughter of a veteran. I am also a granddaughter of a veteran. So super important to me to be involved in the community and especially with veterans and um, those that aren't served correctly in our, our community. So for tonight's presentation, we're gonna kind of go over everything. I gave you a little bit of background on myself, um, some aesthetics of the current building, um, this is kind of our local kind of layout that we have. This is um, a rendering from our Kansas City store. It's very clean and really simple. Probably not what a lot of people are used to when they think about marijuana facilities. We tried to make this very inviting um, so that people don't feel off when they come in. Um, a little background again on the company. We are minority owned and we are women run. So most of my management team, I'm about 80% women operated at this point. Um, a little bit of additional background on us. We have operations in California, Missouri, and Ohio. California, we have a 250,000 square foot greenhouse um, and we are opening a retail store in Santa Monica. That was about a four year process. Um, and we just landed the CUP at the end of October. So that is going under construction as we speak. Uh, Missouri, as noted, we just opened our first store there in Kansas City. We also are building out an 80,000 square foot cultivation manufacturing facility and that'll be live in May. We did have an Ohio facility, but we did sell that to a minority investor at the beginning of 2020, once COVID hit and we kind of were all um, trapped a little bit more at home. So again, a little bit of background on me, um, undergrad, Widener, I got my master's from Villanova and then I went to Anderson. Subsequent to that, I worked for FAO Schwartz in Manhattan. I lived in Florida for about eight years. Uh, I worked for It's Sugar. Some of you may be familiar, it's a hundred retail store, uh, candy store. I was involved in selling that to BBX, which is a publicly traded company. And then subsequently I moved here. Um, Jen McLaughlin is my chief branding officer. Jen is a retailer by trade. She um, has worked at The Gap, American Eagle, Talbots, and she also has a lot of local owned businesses. Her husband and herself have opened two coffee stores, one in Cohasset and the other in Duxbury. And they recently opened a taco store in Hingham. So, if anybody's in the area, definitely check it out. I went there last week, it was amazing. As part of our team, as um, we noted here earlier, Mary O'Connor's on the line, and I also have uh, Chief Linsky, who's our security advisor. Uh, Chief Linsky will probably jump in later when we get into security, but he is a 27 uh, year veteran of Boston Police Department and is incremental in helping us get through a lot of these safety things as we, we navigate with cannabis. Uh, also noted, we have, um, investors that are of Korean descent. Michael Bang is our chief investment officer. Michael has an extensive background with Goldman Sachs and I kind of lean on him for doing a lot of our modeling and analysis. Dr. Song is our chief medical officer. And as we talk about events or having on-site training, Dr. Song is an advocate of cannabis. He really got involved in cannabis when his father was dying of cancer. He is an oncologist and it was kind of the way that he entered into this market was he didn't want his, his father on opiates during his dying days. And he relied heavily on edibles to really have his mindset with him as he was passing on to the next stage of his life. Um, uh, Gwen Takagawa is my compliance officer. She has everything compliance in this company. She is up to date on the constant and ever-changing cannabis rules throughout the country. Um, and we have Mark Niedermeyer, who's in charge of our director of um, outreach. So he'll be heavily involved if we should win this application um, of reaching out to the community, whether it be veterans or other organizations and how we can help and be a good part of the community. Um, our business model obviously is vertical integration. As noted earlier, we have the location in Worcester. We also have Swamp Scott um, and then hopefully this next location. Um, these are some of our current products. Um, we, we named everything local because we really wanted to be part of the community. Local to us meant what can we do in, in each community that we're in? And it's always going to be different. It's always going to really go towards what is needed in each community. The current plan is to have four point of sales and our goal is to do 150 transactions a day. Um, we do have 10 dedicated spots um, 
currently, and I'm planning to have two of those as online pickup. Additionally, we plan to work with some of the social equity guys on delivery services. Um, and this just goes into kind of the customer appreciation day and how we like really get involved with our customers. Um, and it's also about having community education. So whether that be us shutting down for a day and just having a workshop, so people that may not feel comfortable can just come in and just talk and just understand and we can help them and navigate them. And maybe it's just not the right thing for them either, but at least having a better sense of what their options are. Uh, I think that's important to get to the community. So again, we're gonna go over the site. Um, this is the current site as noted earlier, and this is our plan for the site. Um, the goal here is really to have a refreshed look and have a lot more green space. And that's what we did in Swampscott. Um, with Swamp Spot, we also worked with the town to navigate having an easier parking situation, as well as uh, travel studies to make sure that there was no conflicts with any kind of traffic that was going to happen. Again, the aesthetic for us has been very clean. You're not going to see a lot of cannabis promoting. It's a simple atmosphere. We really want to make it inviting for everyone. Um, Pete, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the uh, traffic studies that we've done, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, good evening, board. Uh, good to be before you again. It's great to see everybody. Hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. Um, as you know, we've talked about this uh, location previously with the board uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, during the last uh, presentation before the board, we had not conducted the study, the traffic impact analysis prior to the meeting. Uh, so in this round of application, uh, we elected to do it prior to that so the board would have time to look at it. Um, as you know, the siting of this location, uh, as we've mentioned before, really aligns with what we think town meeting envisioned on the placement of these three uh, cannabis facilities throughout the town. Um, and so we think this is really consistent in keeping with what town meeting had kind of envisioned during the zoning and, and including the implementation of the buffers. Uh, which we all know uh, have been um, very deliberate in how the town has uh, executed those. So uh, everybody should be fairly familiar with 251 Summer Street. It, we think it's a great location. Um, and if you could, Aaron, just go to the next slide, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, perfect. Um, so this is just an overlay of uh, marijuana dispensary zoning analysis. This is just how everything lays out. Uh, in the town, and I don't have my cursor, but you'll see our location with the green star kind of in the middle there. Um, so it's pretty well situated. And if you could, uh, Aaron, go to the next slide. This also shows all the compliance with the buffers and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you'll see our site circled at the top left. And again, the overlay of the Google Maps. Uh, so it's very compliant with all the zoning. You'll see it doesn't hit any buffers, which is what we're highlighting in the top left. Um, uh, in the top left image with the circle around the pink lot, that is um, you know, just demonstrating compliance with all the buffers. If you could go to the next slide. This is overhead, uh, just back one slide. At the bottom right, you'll see there's an overhead picture of the site. We would plan to keep the building primarily in the same area and uh, utilize the parking space to the left where you'll see there's a, a bunch of cars. We'll restripe and re-engineer that lot to be compliant with the local zoning and have appropriately sized and marked parking spaces. So there'll certainly be adequate parking. Uh, we do have under agreement uh, this entire parcel to include the uh, left lot and the right side of the building as you see it here. So any questions on that, uh, I'm happy to take them or I can, I can take them at the end as well. Why don't, why don't we go through Mr. D'Agostino and then I'll, I'll turn it to board members for, for particular questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So um, the safety and security plan, um, again, I have Mr. Linsky on the phone, so I'm happy for him to jump in. Um, basically, we're going to utilize uh, Mr. Linsky to come out, review the site, working with Arlington Police to make sure that we're safe and compliant, um, and really review our security systems to make sure that they're where they need to be. Um, I will tell you, anybody that's dealt with cannabis, these generally turn into probably the most secure locations. Every neighbor should be thrilled to live next door because there is literally cameras everywhere. Like my, my facility in uh, Kansas City has about 62 cameras on a 6,000 square foot building. So there are cameras all throughout the parking lot, all around the building to ensure that everyone is safe, both employees and customers. Um, 
we'll have security on site all hours of operations. We're gonna ensure that um, they're trained adequately and they'll be trained in accordance with the CCC requirements. Any safety or any kind of disregard to any kind of policies that this company has is grounds for immediate termination. And I take that pretty seriously. Um, similar to uh, marijuana free establishments, um, we're gonna design the facility to be safe and secure. We're gonna have commercial grade alarm systems, again, in conjunction with Mr. Linsky giving us advice of what we need to have. We'll have trackable key cards that limit access to certain areas of the store, uh, specifically the vaults and any kind of packaging areas. Um, and we'll also have uh, panic buttons and any kind of redundant intrusion systems. We'll have backup batteries in place for four to six hours. So should there be any kind of interruption to our service, our cameras will always be on. Um, when I get into seeing the um, image of the store, we plan to have a secure in-house uh, delivery. So we're gonna build a garage within our facility. So anytime there is a delivery, that uh, car will pull into the building. So there will be no kind of activity happening in the parking lot or that anyone can see. So this is what I was just referencing. Um, and we just did this also at Swamp Scott where we just built a garage so that there's no need for anything ever to happen in the parking lot, which is always a concern for the neighbors. So the parking lot, there'll be a button, they'll get buzzed in, there's cameras in here, so everything is tracked. As I noted earlier, I come from an extremely, you know, vigorous audit background. Um, so we do a lot of three-way matching with cash, and I also have external auditors that I bring on usually two to three times a year to make sure that we're operating compliantly, not only for ourselves, but from a financial standpoint. I want to make sure everything is ticked and tied. Um, as everyone knows, this is a heavy cash business. So making sure that we're making sure everything is accurate is super important. Um, employee training, diversion, prevention, on-site education. So as noted earlier, um, Dr. Strong is thrilled to come out and potentially educate people that would wanna be educated. We'd probably look early on to do those more frequently to get people you know, aware of what we are and what we do and how we could help them, um, but also how we're gonna try and help the community. Um, our on-site education for our employees, uh, they're gonna go through a lot of training. We also hire a third party to train our employees to make sure that it's not just us coming up with a training guide. It's actually a cannabis training guide to, to make sure that we're compliant. Um, and we'll work with local vendors to have literature, both on-site as well as in the waiting room where people wait. Um, and if there's any questions, our team will be trained to be able to answer that. Uh, as noted earlier, nuisance prevention and diversion is extremely important. So um, having Mr. Linsky working with the police department, as well as ourselves, to make sure that we're, we're just following any guidelines or any things that they may be thinking that maybe is, we're not thinking about. Um, we'll have a track and trace system. Our track and trace system is obviously metric. We use Flow Hub, which is uh, integrated to the track and trace system. Additionally, we use Work, which is a cannabis party, a cannabis payroll provider. Um, and that's also integrated through Flow Hub so that we're able to track everybody down to their number. So everything is very trackable. Um, and again, the nuisance prevention, well, nothing will be tolerated. We, we, don't, we don't want to be a hazard to the neighborhood. We want to be good neighbors. The goal is to be successful. If we're successful, the town is successful. Um, and I do not handle anyone that is going to be causing any kind of issues on site, whether that be our own employees or someone else. And then the benefits is really, you know, the HCA, a charitable, as I discussed earlier, we do a lot of charity activities throughout the country as noted, um, Swamp Scott being veterans. Out in California, we work with a lot of um, underserved communities. So we work with the Girls Club. We also uh, had my guys go out on a weekend and they built a park. So it was a really fun activity for them. Great team building for them, but also an appreciation for things that you're not thinking that, you know, how lucky you are every day. Um, we participate in a lot of neighborhood and civic associations. This uh, building plans to have 18 full-time positions. So the estimated payroll is gonna be 800 to a million dollars a year. Um, so we're really, and the goal is to really hire as many local people as possible. Most of these are gonna be salaried employees, generally good paying salary employees uh, jobs. So having people local is super important. You know, so it knows you wanna have somebody that's able to go in. An alarm goes off, we wanna make sure that there's somebody local to handle it. So having locals on the ground is very, very important. Um, and these were just some of the things I just already had mentioned. This is the Girls Inc. and the building out of the park that we did. Uh, in Massachusetts, we work with the Urban League. 
So um, really having that social equity is extremely important to me uh, and giving back to those people that may be um, underserved or displaced, especially during COVID. Uh, it's been a real challenging time for a lot of people and I wanna make sure that we set people up for success. The Massachusetts market is one of the biggest markets in the Northeast. It's estimated to be a billion dollar market in the next few years. Um, we currently obviously hold a license in uh, Storm Scott. We estimate that this store should do 5 million to 7 million a year and estimating a two and a half percent tax range, it's about 125 to 175,000 a year, plus additionally the benefit of the HCA for the town. And again, these are just high level numbers They're in the presentation, so I won't go too in depth, but this is really just noting where the most of the expenses go and clearly it's highly designated to payroll. Um, and these are just the responses that Mary already answered uh, early on. So I'm gonna leave that go for now. And then if you guys have any questions for myself, Mary, Pete, or uh, Mr. Linsky, we're here to answer those. Great, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I will now turn to the board. Um, actually, before I do that, maybe um, if I could ask Attorney Heim, I, I probably should have done this before the presentation, just in terms of um, based on where we were um, in, in terms of a process here with the, the uh, HCA. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add in terms of process or the compliance with the buffer zones or, or, or anything of that nature before I turn it to board members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll just provide a, a quick reminder uh, for any members of the board that might want to refresh or members of the public that um, the process before the board is only is really limited to uh, whether or not it will grant a host community agreement to um, the applicant. We've already granted host community agreements to two uh, marijuana retailers in Arlington. Uh, to my understanding, one is open, the other one is not yet open. Uh, the board is not obligated to grant an HCA to anybody, uh, but this is now the third round of HCA solicitations that the board has had. Uh, to my recollection, this particular applicant has been before the board at least twice before. Um, the process, uh, this is especially for the public's uh, sort of education reminder, the process only begins here. If the board were to grant an HCA to this applicant, the applicant still has to go through the special permitting process, which is administered by the Arlington Redevelopment Board. That process is primarily about compliance with zoning bylaws. So while the uh, applicant has prepared a number of uh, things about things like traffic studies, those things are, are, are typically handled in a great deal of depth before uh, the redevelopment board, which was the case with the pot gun is the case also with uh, escar i believe additionally there's a parallel process um, the applicant um, one of the sort of big changes between some of the applicants prior submissions here is they now have uh, i believe licenses or hcas and provisional licenses with the cannabis control commission in massachusetts where they did which they didn't in previous um, iterations i believe uh, they've already referenced the locations of those um, <clears throat> The, um, the Cannabis Control Commission also does a vetting process, obviously, for anybody who's uh, seeking a license to open a retail establishment or any other kind of license. Um, there's, so, so there's a lot of layers of review that happen either in parallel or after this process. This process is really about the board uh, using its own criteria to make sure it's comfortable proceeding with the host community agreement uh, setting forth the basic parameters of what that host community agreement will be. Uh, typically in the past, what the board has done is charged the town manager and my office with negotiating a uh, host community agreement. As the board may recall, uh, we've stuck strictly to the legal criteria uh, established by uh, the state and have not asked for extra payments or more money or anything like that, which uh, happened in some other communities. We've stuck pretty straight and narrow to um, uh, the four corners of what HCAs can include. Um, so unless board members have any other questions for me, the only other thing I'd note is that uh, my office had previously vetted this applicant in terms of its corporate structure, in terms of uh, its compliance with the site location, all that kind of stuff. Um, nothing has really changed other than the fact that the applicant uh, now holds more licenses in Massachusetts than they, I mean, has HCAs and provisional licenses in Massachusetts that they didn't previously have. 
uh, none of those exceeds the number that you're allowed to have in Massachusetts. So um, the applicant is, 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 is still in good standing as far as my office is concerned. And then uh, the other information you have is obviously from the marijuana study group. Thank you. And thank you, Attorney Hine, for, for, for the overview and for your, for your guidance. Um, I will start with um, Mr. Diggins, who was had attended the marijuana study group uh, meeting for any questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so yes, I mean, I was part of the, the marijuana study group and we had a nice discussion about um, Calix Peak. Uh, uh, and I have to say, um, um, we're, we're pleased, you know, we, we put out a positive um, recommendation to to the board. You know, I will say about the process, my, one of the things I regret about it is that we can't have the, I won't say we can't, but we haven't had the applicants uh, at those meetings because we certainly be um, um, enlightening, I think, to talk with them uh, at those meetings. So I am just going to ask a few questions and then have a, a statement at the end uh, and potentially a motion. Uh, so um, if you could go to the slide uh, referencing uh, your director of outreach of Op operations and community outreach, uh, Ms. Mark Niedermeyer. And, and um, on that, it mentions that there's a mission statement of the company. So what's the mission statement? Sorry, I'm missing where you're seeing that. Okay, let me see if I can go to it myself. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time pulling this up. Yeah, I'll go to it myself. See if I can. The slides weren't numbered, so it's a little hard to just kind of specify which slide. So, so it's where you're introducing the staff, and, and um, there's Gwen. Um, oh, okay. That's, yeah. I see it. Yeah. So formally, we really have cut back on our staff just to, to give you a heads up on that. Um, we did a lot of restructuring in 2020. So our formal mission statement is shop local, buy local, be local. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of very obviously an evolving thing, but that's what the important message behind local is. So it's hiring and being part of the local community. Gotcha. All right, cool. Thank you. Uh, and and um, so can you give me a sense of the, the nature of the outreach that you might do in Arlington? Um, so again, it's about having like reaching out with Mark and reaching out to some of the community activities that are there. I would love to reach out to the veterans, as I noted earlier, that's something that's extremely close to my heart and I'm passionate about. Um, Pete, who's on the phone, is, is also a former, former military. So for me, that's extremely important. Also important for us is equity. Um, and I know you guys talked about that a lot tonight. Um, I've already started working with the Urban League and how we could either do some on-site training. What else can we do to help? How, is, how can I, as a CEO, develop the next CEO? You know, how, can, how do I find the guy that's going to take my job? That's, that's what it's about. And finding those people that really have been impacted through cannabis, but also given the recent situations with COVID, you know, a little background myself, my husband's a teacher. So we've watched a lot of what has happened over the last two years and how it's impacted families um, and a lot of these children. So super important for us to be involved. Great, thank you. Um, so from, from your market research, you know, um, I, I'll ask a question then say a little more before letting you answer it, you know, or asking to answer it. I mean, how many marijuana shops do you think Arlington could handle? Uh, and I ask you that because I wonder to what extent the, you're wanting to be here is a function of the fact that we have, um, we are on, uh, at this point allowing only three, three um, establishments. So that's, that's obviously important. Um, given that there is nothing really close in proximity besides Apotheca right now, and obviously the other host community agreement that's out there, um, having places that are not served as well is really important. You know, we've been looking at other areas along the coast as well, where there's a 10, 10 to 15 miles, but everybody knows with Boston traffic, that could be 30, 40 minutes, um, especially on a snow day. So finding areas that aren't on top of each other and aren't highly populated are important, is important. So, but I mean, do you think Arlington could handle more than three establishments? Well, if I'm being greedy, no, 
if you're going to get this <laughs> <laughs> right uh, because it, it, you know as you add more it obviously it's just going to detract from other businesses so knowing that we will probably pull a little bit from a path but depending on where people are buying from um and somebody else will pull from us right that's just the way it's going to work until the market kind of settles and everybody lands with their three um recreational licenses which is all you're allowed to have um so it's going to be a continuing evolving land a little bit of a footprint uh, until the, the ship kind of lands itself gotcha Larry, if i could add to that if, if i may um <laughs> mr diggis how are you sir good to see you again it's been a while um you know i think when we think about the um kind of the market in in arlington i mean we, we have apotheca who really services the heights area of of the town and then you have um escobar which would be on the east side and uh then calyx really serving the middle of arlington and i know we we talked about this at the last go around i really feel as though that was the intent of, of town meeting uh, to, to spread them out with the with the 2000 foot buffer and i think this meets that intent um and and it doesn't detract from the other businesses that you've approved in town. Um, I think when I think of Arlington and, and how challenging it has been to get property and, and meet these 2000 foot buffers and, and actually get these businesses spread out, to add a fourth or fifth one could become more challenging because they're gonna have to go between two of the entities, whether it's between us and Escobar or, or uh, Apotheca or whatever the case may be. So I think the, the, the way this has, come together is a little bit interesting uh, because I think, you know, putting in the buffers the way the town did, they, they actually got the result they were hoping for. Um, so I think it, with that, uh, hopefully the, the board would move forward with this applicant and, um, and then, you know, give it some time to evaluate how those three businesses are operating uh, and servicing the town uh, before they added more. Thank you. So, um, regarding your um, your your, your um, discipline with respect to your, your uh, employees, I mean, so across your um, your businesses, have you had any terminations due to employees? I mean, just not following the rules, or 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 worse. I've had one theft, um, small amount, but yep, was caught on camera. Security caught it immediately, and he was escorted off the property. Just one. Yep. Okay. That was at cultivation. So, my cultivation facility in um, California, we have about sixty employees. Um, at the highly Hispanic population, um, super diligent workers, um, and we just yep caught somebody putting something up his sleeve. Cultivation's a little different animal. Um, the way that it works there is everything is weighed every time it goes into every room. So that is the interesting part about cannabis and people worrying about theft. It is so tracked. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty impressive how tracked all of this product is. And so um, one last question, and, and, and that is regarding the salaries, because there was some concern about that being in the study group. Being. And so um, will there be benefits associated with these salaries? Yes, um, we offer a really good benefit plan. We actually cover 75% and they're eligible for benefits 60 days after they start. Mm, right. And we have currently we just have medical and dental and vision. We are working on a 401k plan. Um, it's an ever evolving thing. And so is that part of the total when you say it's a 800K to 1 million payroll? Uh, it does not include any kind of 401K. It does include healthcare benefits, um, taxes, et cetera. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, I guess one of the concerns is, is well, I don't guess. I mean, one of the concerns is that in you know, mean, Arlington is just a pretty expensive place uh, to live. I mean, and so, so um, uh, with 18, employees mean at 800k to one 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 million it's still going to be a little tight mean uh um, well rather tight me for for um for someone you know to live here mean and work there but you know it's the market's what it is mean and and, and i uh, uh it's not so just the, some of those 18 are hourlies right we always open it up where if it's someone who you know college kid who just wants to put in three hours after school so mm -hmm. We expect that there's, you know, there's always a demand fluctuation in the evening when people are leaving work. So it's great when the college kids want to work for you, like from four to eight, because right. it gives them the opportunity to make extra money. And then it's not a full-time job. The full-times are really more the secure, uh, security, supervisors, managers, assistant managers. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, a 40, 45 hour job a week. But um, I, I believe the pay is, 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 is very good. 
I mean, so I hear you in a second, it's not a deal breaker for me. Ian. And so I'll, I'll ask the chair, I mean, is this time for a motion? Um, well, what I, what I was gonna do is have questions first, Mr. Diggins, and then yeah. I can return in the order if, if, if there's a motion, if, if that's- Sure, uh, yeah. no, I'm happy to ask the, the sequencing, you know, so, cause sometimes I'm all, all about the questions and then I let it go and then someone makes a motion. It's like, oh, I should have done that. I mean, so so I'll just end with a, a comment and that is to say, uh, I am really happy to see you back. And, uh, and I've told the story uh, a few times being um, um, in the first vote. Uh, uh, and I uh, was, I did not vote for approval of Kayla's Peak. Peak. And, and uh, Mr. Hurd had made uh, an argument being for um, voting in the affirmative mean and I thought about that argument uh, a lot when I, I left mean and I did regret not voting for for you all um, the reason I didn't was because I had very much wanted to see another establishment in the east because I felt the east could handle it and that the entity that was going for it was very close to the 2000 just didn't quite make it I'll also add that I was one of the people that voted in the special town meeting for the amendment that would have eliminated the buffer at all because I really just kind of wanted to see more market competition and, and given that the East we voted two to one um, in precincts three and four for allowance of, um, of marijuana establishments I mean uh, we the notion of, of NIMBYs would have not really held much water for me so that was my rationale was that i was hoping that by by not voting that that they would someone would find another establishment in the east I mean and, and hopefully it would have been been you it didn't work out uh i really appreciate that you have hung in there uh, you've been really respectful um throughout the entire process I mean uh, you have a good track record in uh, uh uh and so so um you can tell where I'm going on this, especially since I was on the study committee. So thanks for entertaining all my questions. And also to my colleagues, thanks for, for um, um, tolerating all the time I've taken. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins, I don't recall what my argument was, but it doesn't look like I need it in this meeting. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm gonna be brief in that this is, I think the third or fourth time that we've got a presentation by Calix Peak. I've been impressed by the presentation every time that's come before us. The first time, obviously, there was an issue with the buffer and Apotheca was an established business. Um, and then I did vote for Calix Peak the second time around. I like this site. I think, I think it's a good site for it. I think you know, when we first had community host agreements before us, it was still the time period where we envisioned lines down the street of cars going to these establishments. But, you know, I've been in Apotheca, it's not more than one or two people in there at a time at this point. Um, and I don't envision that there'll be major traffic issues in this location. It is a location that used to be a very well known service station run by uh, well known people in town, but it's been depressed for more than a few years. And I think this would be a good addition to the neighborhood right in at that location so and again i'm i'm very impressed by what i see from calyx peak that you're a very professional company and you come prepared and you are in fact persistent and <laughs> you have a very strong commitment to serve the town of arlington and the residents here since you uh but many, many calls. I got many calls as a chair, and I know Steve has as well. So I'm happy to move this forward. I'm happy to finally take these HCA agreements off of Attorney Himes' plate because I know that it's been a lot of work on with him, for him and his staff over the past couple of years. And I think we're in a good place with the three that we hopefully will uh, approve as of tonight. And uh, I'm happy to see you guys back. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to match Mr. Hurd's brevity, but it might not make it. Anyone who knows me. Um, I just have, I think, four questions uh, around um, on-site security, um, Chief Linsky's role, 
Um, and three to six months after, if you are successful, this establishment opens. Who, meaning what position, or if you already know who the person is, will be the daily on, on site security supervisor? So we obviously haven't hired anyone yet. So I won't, I don't know who that person will be. Um, so I, I apologize. Um, Mr. Linsky, I'm happy to have you jump in and kind of go over how you're involved with us and help us with our. Sure. And can I add to yes. that? When you, when you do um, hire the person, will Chief Linsky be involved? Uh, yeah. And also, he'll be involved in training them. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, so my name is Dan Linsky. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a recovering cop. I was a cop for 28 years in the city of Boston. Uh, and now I've been recovering for about almost seven, eight years now. Uh, I was the chief of the Boston Police Department when I left uh, my service with the city. And my most coming event, I was in charge during the marathon bombing attack uh, and had many of your officers from Arlington come over to help us in a, a bad day in Watertown. Um, I met with uh, Chief Flaherty and had conversations about this location. My job is a security consultant. I am not going to be the day-to-day -day security manager, although what the team and, and Aaron has asked me to do is to do more than what my, my team designs the physical security standards, the access control programs, where we put cameras, what type of cameras, how people sign in and sign out, policies, procedures, and all of the day-to-day -day, uh, operational procedures. I will not be overseeing day-to-day -day operations of security. I will work with uh, the team to determine who that will be, uh, vet that person, make sure they are well-trained, well-equipped, and well-prepared to do it, although I will be at their right hand. Um, one of the things the team has asked me to do is to go outside the four walls of the facility to make sure that one of our clients leaves our facility and goes down the street to Arlington Catholic and uses the parking lot to use product. Um, and somebody takes a photograph of that, a picture, a video, uh, the police interact with that individual, we get a report of it. They can contact the security manager or they can contact me. And that person is no longer welcome at any Calix Peak facility in Massachusetts. Uh, we value what communities allow us to do and value the licenses they give us. And if anyone wants to not obey the rules, they're not welcome at our facility. So we've got a, a good neighbor agreement with everybody. Uh, I'm working day to day with the team to set up the policies, procedures, training, uh, make sure the security manager is well suited, working with them on individual investigations. If we get uh, one of the events where an employee is uh, diverting product or we have an issue or concern, um, my job is to work with the security manager that we pick in the Arlington Police Department and any other whether it's the Cannabis Control Commission or the city uh, zoning board or anyone to make sure that all of the information, issues and concerns are there. And if there's an investigation needed, we do it. We also, it's great to have 52 cameras that record 24 hours a day. Um, one of the things we do for our clients is kind of uh, compliance. So I go in and pull video, um, random videos of different days, different days, hours, types, and, and see whether or not Everyone who is on board is complying with what we said we would do for rules and policies. So there's limited access to the safe, right? However, if sometimes people get lazy and people prop a door open and people who shouldn't be in there are helping carry things out, we go in and look at video. And if that's the case, we first uh, discipline, train, and if not, remove. Um, the other things we do with our clients are secret shopper training, where our team will go in, try and use fake IDs, see if our security team that's in-house is working well or not working well to uh, address issues of diversion to youth in the community. So um, my job is not to be the day-to-day -day operations manager, but to help quarterback that team and support them going forward. I, I look at it as the Bill Belichick of the Calix Peak security team uh, where I'm coaching and directing and hopefully bringing in a new Super Bowl this year against that evil man in Tampa Bay who left us. And I, I didn't talk until I was three. My mother thought I was deaf and mute and had me tested. And now she says she can't shut me up. So I'll shut up. And if you have other questions, let me know. Well, I, I just wish, wish um, Coach Belichick gave uh, after game interviews the way you just gave your presentation. Um, no, no, I appreciate that. And then I understand the, 
motto, mantra, if you see something, say something. And my daytime job is a court reporter. Um, but when that fails, especially around public safety, construction, you know, those types of entities that um, abide to that, it has, you know, some really serious consequences. And what I've seen when it's failed is when something has been going on that isn't safe, whether it's not safe to your employees, whether it's not safe to your patrons, and there's nobody trained there that can recognize that situation, that that's not safe, whether it's in terms of running a business, whether it's in terms of, um, you know, how you dig up against a rubble stone wall and workers go underneath and the workers don't know that they put themselves in safety. Um, so my thing is, um, I guess I would just leave it, uh, unless you have anyone had any kind of quick brief thing to that. I really stress the, um, sometimes people fall into, oh, see something out, see something, say something, but you, you need to have someone um, on site that is qualified uh, to recognize that versus a college student. And I'm not putting that down. That's that's coming in working four to eight or five to nine or anything like that. So. You're absolutely correct. And um, that's what my job is to do to make sure that the team there is well versed to deal with any situation that comes forward. I've kind of made a career off of that. Um, the other thing we've talked to the chief about is um, there is some technology available where our video cameras could be uh, easily accessed by the Allenton Police Department anytime they wanted them through some technology that's available. And uh, we've offered that if, if need be um to to make sure that they can actually do their own kind of check in and peek if, if need be or in the case of an emergency going forward we want to train our staff to deal with all kinds of emergencies you know i don't anticipate uh robberies however uh if there's a robbery take it we get, take what you need we've got a bunch of cameras we're going to work with the Allen police department to get you out of there we're going to train our staff how to make sure they don't put themselves in harm's way over a bunch of product uh, if somebody's desperate to do something. We've also designed our facility to hopefully have you go to the other two facilities in Allington if you want to do a robbery, because ours is a little more security uh, enhanced and, and we're uh, deterring people from doing that. But I agree with you, we need to prepare people for all hazards. And um, that's not something uh, Aaron and the team takes lightly. They're very serious about making sure we keep our clients safe and our team safe. Thank you. and. Um... The last two things <clears throat> really just don't expect comments here because I'm just putting it out. It goes sort of beyond um, our scope here. Uh, but I know you and your team and, and Attorney O'Connor will be addressing this. Um, just as you move forward, I know when you designed the building and um, uh, leveled the site to whatever plane you do, um, I'm not well versed on flooding impacts up um, in this location, except for when we have those really quick flash floods um, that, you know, so I, I know that's not before this board, if you do move forward, um, but I just would put a, a plug into that to, um, as I know you will have your team look at um, what this building, it seems like you're putting it pretty much in the same place, adding the garage, 10 car parking lot. Um, but as you move forward and come, if you do before the appropriate uh, body, I just wanted to put the pitch in. Um, and lastly, I know it's a little small little thing. Um, I know one time at one of the previous hearings, it drove me crazy because it was probably said 60 times, but just moving forward, and this is the transcriptionist to me, I just like word search um, city or town and you know, and just make sure, like, if you're going to a city, it says, you know, abide by city ordinances, city zoning bylaws, stuff like that. Um, you did, I did hear Mr. Dagson, he said, sit down meeting, well versed with it, he knew everything there. It's just a small little thing, but um, uh, I just like moving forward with other cities and towns, I just have, you know, whoever your really good admin person is, just say, you know, okay, we're going before town, let's search city. <laughs> And vice versa. So it's no big, not at this meeting, but I know we had a previous meeting. I only saw it once in all your sub submissions and your PowerPoint. So that's not bad. But um, I know it's a pet peeve, but 
to me, like when you come into a community, if you recognize what their form of government is and, and are consistent, that really gives me a sense that they know where they're coming to. They've done their research as you have. So um, with that, I will thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful presentation and all your legwork. Um, I appreciate some clarification on the intention because the way I've read this, the full breadth of your materials is it's a bit of a inconsistency that I might probably just misunderstanding about your intent about whether you would retrofit the existing facility or do a teardown. Because um, I just kind of saw it, saw different things in different places. I um, mean, if you could not only answer that, but kind of explain your business rationale and you know what what you'd really prefer to do and why. Um, well, some of this is going to come down to supply chain, and as I'm sure everybody knows right now, supply chain is extremely disruptive, um, and just getting people on site is really challenging. Um, yeah. So this it's going to come down. Originally, I think the plan before I started um, was always to be a teardown. Um, I visited the site multiple times. I've met with Mr. Pinchetti, and. If we can, I prefer to retrofit it, um, build off of what's already there, still make it gorgeous and beautiful, um, but maybe mitigating some of the noise to neighbors from tearing down a building, but we have to see what we can possibly do. So I don't have the exact answer and we'd have to go um, get architectures to do that, architectural drawings. Okay. But I know the plan originally was always a teardown. I'm leaning towards not it being a teardown, so it moves a little quicker. Okay, so that's kind of up, up, up in the air. Yeah. Are you confident that in either scenario you can fully execute the security, the mitigation for traffic, the green space, um, and everything else that, that you're promising? Yes. The building size won't change. It's just whether or not it comes down and goes up or I could retrofit it to still be in that same area. Okay. So I'm not worried about any aesthetics changing. It's really going to come down to a speed of how we can get this done. and. What, what I'm really working with, right? Well, once we go in there and actually have an architect come in and a contractor come in, mm -hmm. I don't know what the bones of that building even are. Okay. So that's that's okay. kind of why I'm I'm in between. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. Thank you. Um, can you say more about what you mean about green space? I think that in, 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 in municipal government, that has sometimes a specific meaning uh, implying public use. And I'm not sure that's really what we mean here, but I'd be happy to know kind of what, what you think about what that and what kind of benefit um, to that to the community um i don't know if it's a community benefit it's it's a community benefit just adding more trees adding some grass making it a little more beautified than mm -hmm. it kind of is right now which is a little bit of a concrete jungle mm -hmm. um just making it a little bit more inviting yeah sure okay but no it won't be anywhere where anybody's gonna sit or loiter or anything like that yeah yeah that, that's fine yeah green space often implies a park you know or mm -hmm. bench is there anything so yeah okay great um and my final question, and, and this is a question, and I think in, in a caution, I just invite you to elaborate about this. Um, you know, I noticed one thing I really appreciated in your application is you talked about your your strong commitment to only marketing to people over the age of twenty five, and you even cited some good brain science of, about why it's a good idea to wait until you're that old before you initiate marijuana use. And that, from my day job, um, I spent many years working in addictions and public health. Um, you know, that's right on. De delaying is, is a really good idea. The same goes for drinking. Um, so I appreciate that. One concern that I had um, is talking about your outreach to military veterans and the materials, talk about the potential um, advantages of, of, of cannabis use. Um, and and I, I think the caution I have and, and the invitation I have for you to elaborate is um, you know, that's a population that is not immune to substance use disorder. And in fact, uh, rates of substance use disorders in the military veteran population range, but they could be as high as 12, 13% in veterans who have served since 2001. So there can be a vulnerability, particularly for veterans who have a co-occurring PTSD um, and, and other uh, disorders and self-medication, you know, with, with um, alcohol, with cannabis, with other drugs. Um, is it something the veterans will turn to, but what they really need is treatment for their for their PTSD symptoms. So, you know, my my concern is that the outreach isn't just marketing about how cannabis could be beneficial, but is honest and is balanced and is medically grounded in uh, good information about uh, you know on, on that topic and and um, and genuinely encourages people. Um, 
to not use your product if it is going to interfere with their mental wellness and is going to, uh, per, to, to put them at higher risk for addiction or for a recurrence. So I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on that, just so I can kind of feel better about your approach when you talk about that outreach. Yeah, so as I noted earlier, um, one of our um, owners, uh, investors is a doctor. He's an oncologist. Having him come in and, and meeting with veterans groups and talking to them um, is high on his priority list of things to do. Um, and obviously he's a doctor. His, his goal is not to be there to push pills or push drugs or push us even per se. It's really to educate um, and help them navigate what is the best course for them. Um, and you know, at one of my Santa Monica meetings, um, a local brought up and she was a nurse can you give out free, like a little binder so that somebody that goes home and tries something can write down what those symptoms, like what happened? Like if I took an edible and it did this, well, maybe that's, I don't want it anymore. And how do you find that right balance of what's best for that person? Because every person is different. Every mm -hmm. age group is different. Females react differently than men, just like with alcohol. So making sure that they're, we're, we're educating based on the science and the facts is important and not just pushing it because it's a profit. Mm -hmm. And as far as the marketing, you know, a lot of the marketing that happens in this industry right now is a lot of email and, and texting, right? I mean, it's the, the world has changed. Mm -hmm. Everything is flagged. Obviously, I can't prevent a 21-year-old from coming into our store, but I can turn them off from being on our email list. Mm -hmm. So whether we're promoting markdowns or promoting a special event, we can turn them off from that. Um, so that would be the intent there is just flag that button so that anybody that's under 25 we're not marketing to per se. Again, I can't prevent them to coming in, but our goal isn't to get a 22 year old in the store every night. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. I appreciate the responses. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have any further questions. My colleagues have really covered some of the ground um, that I was going to. So turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And uh, I also wanna thank the Caleb Speak team for coming in again. Mr. D'Agostino has been a frequent visitor uh, at our meetings. He's back with us again today. Just a couple of questions. And, and one had to do with the, you mentioned online pickup. I'm just um, wanted to hear a little bit more about security for those type of transactions and, and um, you know, how that would differ from the customer showing up to the site, um, if, if, it, if it differs at all in terms of, of going into the building or the interaction um, with, with your staff. Yeah, so the parking is just so that they can come in. They show their the front desk their online order, and they could just pop in really quickly and grab it versus sitting there trying to browse, figure out what they want. Um, someone like myself, I know exactly what I want, so I hunt down where it's at, and if I have to drive 45 minutes, that's where I go to get it. Um, and it's just easier to walk in, grab it, and be out the door. So okay. mitigating traffic and also mitigating too many people in one place, especially given COVID, um, and taking people's time into consideration is super important. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, it's similar to the Dunkin' Donuts app that, you know, many, uh, not me, but my, my kids have where they hit an app on the phone and order their stuff and they walk in, pick it up and go. Um, however, you, you walk up to the store, the security outside will check your ID to make sure you're 21 and it's a valid ID and that you're the person ID. You'll then go in and go to your uh, quick order pickup line. And we will again check your ID to make sure you're the person and it matches the, the response. So um, we still have the same security metrics. It just, as Erin mentioned, it, it helps with timing issues, parking and traffic issues. Um, and it is all an internal system that's well regulated cyber wise. Okay, th 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 thank you for that uh, information. And the other thing I wanted to ask about, and this came up previously when uh, Calix Peak was before us, just while this is a B4 zone, it is surrounded by a neighborhood. And, and I did believe there was discussion about what you were doing in Swampscott, because I think there are residences uh, nearby that facility. What you did there now, what you found as you're getting closer to opening that you would do with neighborhood outreach for this site if, if uh, you were selected. Aaron, you want me to go through what we did there a little bit or you? Yeah, so it's really a communication thing um, and, and Pete can jump in, but we, um, once we were approved, it was, you know, Pete, Pete will jump in on, on his meetings that he's had, but our, our contractor also reaches out every week to tell them what's going on, if it's going to impede traffic, if there's going to be extra noise, 
anything that matter, like we, we've given them a three month timeline, but every Monday, if something should change over the weekend, you know, we had snow last week, so things got delayed. We get an email on Monday morning out to all the neighbors just to give them a heads up of what's going on. And then Pete, if you want to jump in. Yeah, it, it, Aaron, that, that was a great summary of, of what we're doing now. And, and Mr. Chairman, prior to even beginning construction, we, uh, I don't know if you know our site in Swampscott, but the back of our building to the nearest resident is about 12 feet. Uh, it's very, very close. Uh, we are the only business in the area. We literally sit in the middle of a residential area with no other commercial uses next to us. And uh, we've had an incredibly good experience. There's a shared parking lot with the BFW, but that's, that's all one uh, parcel, if you will. Uh, we've had a great interaction with the neighbors. Uh, and it's just about communication, like Aaron said. We've met with them on site. We've done tours. We did you know, site plan visits. We, we did a pre-construction meeting on site with the contractor. They have the contractor's you know, direct contact information. So just, I think when you're communicating with people at a high level, they appreciate that. They understand construction can be frustrating at times, uh, but we try to limit that as best we can. And we do a lot of that with trying to set the right expectation as to what is coming up. Um, and, and generally once these are open, they're, they're very, you know, very smooth. And as you guys have seen with Apotheca and other places, uh, but, you know, we understand construction uh, can be frustrating, especially in New England during the limited construction window when everybody's trying to get stuff done. And so that's how we, we've just been very proactive. Uh, and then since construction started, um, our project manager sends out emails through the town. Uh, there's, a, there's actually an a, a email chain that includes the town and the direct abutters, and they send out updates as appropriate with updates to schedules and things. So it's about being proactive initially and then executing against it once we're actually on site. Great, thank you. Um, that's all the questions I had. I, what I wanted to do is allow the board to ask questions and then we can move into a phase now if we're prepared to make a motion. And I'll go through in the same order and go back to Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I am happy to make the motion and given the, um, the gravity of this, of this um, motion, I just wanna make sure that I get it right. So. So I'm going to ask you and or, you know, Mr. Heim to give me some guidance on the wording of this motion. Sure. Uh, Attorney Heim, do you um, have any suggestions on a, a uh, wording of a motion? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. I think the appropriate motion would be, if you're inclined to act uh, favorably towards the application, that the board uh, 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 grant a host community agreement to Calix Peak uh, for the location uh, and under the terms of their application contingent upon the successful negotiation of um, the specifics of a host community agreement uh, between the town manager uh, through the town council and Calix Peak. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, the actual host community agreement itself is fairly straightforward and this is now the third time we've gone through it. So I don't think that would take long but I think you'd essentially be uh, approving uh, contingent upon successful negotiation of the terms of the agreement with the, uh, with the manager, which we would then uh, make sure that we bring back to you guys to <laughs> have executed. Well, thank you, Mr. Heim. That certainly simplified things for me. <laughs> so, so, so I'm going to try and, and reduce that down to uh, a, a sentence. So I would like to um, make a motion to, to grant the host um, community agreement contingent upon a, um, a whatever negotiations we need to do in order to make this successful. Great. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Second. This is Mahan. Uh, are we voting on the motion right now? Or are you? No, just any comments on, on no, we have a motion and a second. I don't know if you have any further comments, whether you're, you know, you support it or nothing further and you're ready for a vote. I just wanted to go down the line again. Okay, no, no, and you're not. Just thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Attorney O'Connor. Um, it's nice to see you and um, you always come in very well prepared and as does whoever, whomever you're representing and I definitely appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Helmuth. Nothing further, thank you. 
Okay. Yeah, and I just want to add, I didn't want to say it in the questions phase, but I was I had voted for um, to approve a HCA previously when Calix Peak was here. I'm glad you came back. I appreciate your persistence and the thorough presentation. I, I, I think um, Chief Linsky has added a lot to the discussion here in terms of the security measures and, and uh, working with our Arlington Police Department if, if this goes forward. So I appreciate your presence here tonight. And, and as Mrs. Mahan said, Attorney O'Connor, um, always well prepared for these meetings and, and uh, we appreciate that. And um, so I certainly am, in, am willing to support this with uh, my other colleagues. And uh, with that, on a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay, congratulations. And um, I know there'll be a lot more interaction with the town and uh, for Mr. Degas, you know, fifth, I, I don't think it's the fifth time, but fourth time's a charm. So. <laughs> thank thank <laughs> you very much. Board. I appreciate the board's time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes item 10. Item 11 is a discussion of the select board handbook. Um, and I will turn it over to, to Mrs. Mahan. We had discussions about this previously and I believe she brought it up at um, some meetings back in 2021. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it to her and have a discussion. We may have to come back with specific language, but I, I wanted to um, um, turn it, Turn the meeting over to her on this on, the, on this piece. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have discussed this many times, so um, really just two things I want to accomplish. Um, the first thing is to, um, whenever someone takes out papers for select board, that part of the informational packet they receive, along with any voter data on disk, um, a copy of the select board handbook. Um, so it's, it's kind of a guide of um, sort of a very lengthy job description. And then, um, at, you know, upon successful candidacy election, um, just sign a little face sheet that says, I have received and reviewed the select board handbook with the understanding is if you just pick it up and look at it, that can qualify as review. Not, not saying you have to review this, but I think it's really something that Mr. Greeley and previous board members put a, a lot of time into it. To that end, my second request would be, as since this was, when this was first created, with the exception of myself, we have a totally new select board. Um, and I was hoping that um, in the next whatever amount of months, six months, eight months, um, if, um, I know I've had conversations with Mr. Helmet, and you know there's been some things more like housekeeping um, issues, th things like that can go straight to Ashley. But then also um, maybe sometime in the fall or next spring, um, also have a, an agenda item discussion of how do we bring the select board handbook and make it more current. Um, you know there may be things in there that we can condense and revise. And there may be things that are not in there um, that we should put in there. So two part thing, which is asking my colleagues um, if we could do the first part of it, which is just give it to the town clerk or have it available electronically and say, please include this in the informational issues. Should anyone take out papers? And then um, just, you know, if you've already seen some things that are housekeeping, if you can get it into Ashley, if you've seen some things missing or something that needs to be condensed down, maybe put it on your own tickle list cheat sheet and um, maybe bring it up in the fall or next spring. So I guess first I would ask, I'd like to hear from my colleagues their thoughts on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. So I'm happy to, if I hearing you correctly, Mrs. Mon, you'd like a motion to authorize the town clerk to give any any person taking out papers for a seat on the select board, 
a copy of the select board's handbook. And then, yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to dive into the handbook too much before this meeting, but I, I would definitely be agreeable when putting a future meeting where we have, when we know it's coming up to, for comments, just perusing through it, you can, just the number of licenses, the number of licenses that are taken for all alcohol is, is incorrect. Um, I think Ms. Dre had talked about the open forum. We had changed the wording on that informally. We had done so, and we I think we've referred it to it as the open forum for about a year and a half now plus. So we could certainly update that language as well. So I, I think that's a good idea to for us to all take a look at the handbook and just recommend any updates as necessary to make it current. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Yes, I mean, I'm definitely supportive of, um, of giving it to candidates, I mean, and, and I, I would like to um, get to work on, on um, it some more. I mean, um, it's very good. It's very good. I mean, uh, and, but there are um, certainly some things that I would like to uh, discuss, I mean, um, and, and, and add more so than, than take away. I mean, and, um, and <laughs> I can't imagine being chair without reading this, you know, um, and, and uh, would like to um, certainly definitely add some things to me. Um, uh, so I would like to have a meeting, you know, to work on this sooner rather than later. Uh, uh, of course, that's up to, to the, the chair uh, uh, to decide. Um, and, um, and I'll simply point out that um, uh, in Appendix 2 uh, on page 60, there's mention of a utility poll working group. Hmm. Maybe maybe we could do something with that, you know? <laughs> so anyways, uh, that's it, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. I'm Mr. Helmer. Yeah, I, I think these are both great ideas. Uh, I will say as, the, as the, most, the newest member of the board, I read the handbook when I was considering running. It helped me understand what the job was. It helped me actually had a, played a substantial role in deciding for sure that I, that I was interested in it. Uh, I read it again after I was elected and saw just how out of date it was <laughs> in some areas. Um, so, you know, uh, I would suggest, uh, I'd be happy to support the motion. I would suggest if we uh, proactively provide this to candidates, um, although I happen to think that we have a really good candidate for re-election for the open board seat uh, coming up, but uh, but if there are future ones, uh, that it, it have a some kind of a... Uh, a disclaimer or informational disclaimer that, that the, the document is in process of being updated, you know, for for corrections and updated or, or, or forthcoming, um, just because we know it's been a long time since it's been revised. Um, and to that end, you know, I wonder if, um, a, you know, a working group or subcommittee of two board members might be uh, appropriate to just organize um, the flagging of this. I mean, there's, I think that Mr. Hurd suggested there's, you know, some of this is housekeeping, or maybe Ms. Mahan said this, the housekeeping updates, but the experienced board members here particularly will will immediately be able to spot things that are that are out of date, um, and I think maybe the, the newer board members like myself and Mr. Diggins, um, you know, might be in a good position to think about what's missing. You know, think about what could be helpful to to people who are. I mean, I'm still Mr. Diggins is an old hand. I'm still learning the ropes, um, so you know that. So may, you know, some kind of a mix might be good, uh, but but perhaps with the goal of uh, pushing out some of the updates and corrections that are administrative early, you know, and then really digging into the document to see how can we make it stronger and better, you know, might, might be an approach. Um, but um, but I, I think it's great that, that Ms. Mahan brought this up again, because it's, um, it was an incredibly, even though it was out of date, it was a very useful document to me. And I think not only to potential candidates, but for, for residents who want to understand this, uh, this office and its function, um, another thing I, I learned running for the office is talking to people instead of running for select board and they'd, I would get this look and, you know, they would, you could tell they wanted to understand that you know, most people really don't spend a lot of time thinking about what we do and, and what should they, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's unusual. It's not, if you don't come from this area, there aren't select boards in other states, you know, so, um, you know, I think that it could be a useful document that once it's cleaned up, uh, we could, even promote more proactively as an educational piece for, for residents about uh, what the function of this office is. So, rah, rah. Thank you, Ms. Talent. Yeah, and I, I agree. So um, why don't we take, we can take action on the first part tonight as, as, as part of the motion. 
And then um, I think it makes sense. I'm happy to put this on for discussion, but I think, I think maybe what I'd like to do is maybe ask board members, take a look at, at the handbook. If there are things that could, we can change right now and then we can put it on for, for further discussion. But I think Mrs. Mahan, maybe right in terms of a more extensive uh, look at it probably is is later in the year, but but let's let's try to try to get moving on that. So um, so I'll take a well t the motion. I'll take it as a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, to provide the handbook to anybody taking out papers, and um, and then we will schedule something before um, over, over the next month or two to to revisit this in terms of timing for particular right. items. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn to Attorney Heim for the vote if everybody's clear on, on what the vote is in terms of what we'll do in the short term. Okay. So, yep, so Attorney Heim, we can uh, take the vote on that. Okay, Mr. Hurd. I was laughing, Mr. Chair, because I was thinking to myself how you might want to update it right away to say how horrible the, the position <laughs> of the select board is. For any potential candidates thinking of calling out papers, but I know you're a lot more ethical than that. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Diggins. Yes. The meeting started at 7 15 and ended at 12 15. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Helmet. Yes, and it's too late, Mr. DeCourcy. You're already <laughs> you're already committed. <laughs> Mrs. Mahan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd, for making attorney Han giggle. I think that's the second time since he's yeah been at one of our meetings that uh yes mr de Corsi. yes yeah it's both okay thank you um all right item 12 for discussion future select board meetings so right now we only have one more meeting scheduled which is for january 24th um so if we could look at our calendars i'm gonna um suggest one thing for february um, if February 7th it will be two weeks out. That actually works better on my schedule than starting something on the 14th. It does create an issue the week of the 21st because I think that's a holiday week, but um, just want to ask board members to take a look at their calendars. That 7th is one date that I would like to have a meeting on, but I'm open on other dates in the month. I'm just seven because either way, I mean, we're going to have a three week gap, right? Because either we would do the 14th, which we have three week gap between now and between the 24th, I mean, and the 14th, or we do the seventh. And, and uh, it is one way to get out of a Valentine's Day meal, but no, let's not do <laughs> the 14th if we can avoid it. Oh, but just uh, historically and procedurally for the office, we need two meetings in February. Yeah. So, so yeah, it either looks like the 23rd or the 28th. That's yeah. So, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Ms. Mahan. Go ahead. If I had to pick one, I'd like 23, just because it's you know enough time for the office for things that they have to get on. But I'm also okay with the 28th. So whatever the rest of my colleagues think is best for them. Well, if the office needs more time, you know, than the 23rd, I mean. I mean, it's fine. I mean, otherwise, I was just assuming the 28th. But if there's technical reasons for doing the 23rd, then by all means. Well, yeah. just, that, just that when people come in, if they're told they have to wait later, I mean, they, they want it, everything done sooner. I need this right away, you know. So um, just for the office to, to continue the office functioning and doing the business administratively, what they need to do, I think. Um, Going from seven to 28, that's too much of a stretch of time. That's three weeks. Because um, people come in and, you know, they can't say, well, you, you could have done this two, three months ago. And they're like, no, but I need it by the next 12 days. So just having worked in there, I, I would put out seven and 23. But if it turns out to be seven, 28, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, okay, thank you. How, how is the 23rd? I, 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 and that does spread it out roughly every couple of weeks. Um, is the 23rd good with other members? Okay. Um, now in March, I mean, we don't know, Attorney Heim is gonna be updating us at some point in terms of what's on the warrant, what we need for here, warrant article hearings. And that will take up a lot of our work in, in March. Um, I think 
right now we schedule two meetings and we see what the warrant looks like and we may have to schedule more. So um, what, uh, how does the 7th and the 21st look for, for, for March? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and, and I would say, you know, let's be prepared, I mean, to do all the Mondays because last year we ended up I mean, going, I think like at least six meetings straight because we had a pretty intense uh, agenda, well, pretty intense warrant. And, uh, and, and if we um, finish early, can get our report out early, I know that it would make a lot of people happy. Okay, all right. And, and I think at this point, I don't know if we need to do April, I think February and March, and we'll see where we are in, in mid-March um, in terms of what our schedule is. So it would be February 7th, February 23rd, March 7th and March 21st. Um, but with the understanding, we may have to leave some nights open depending on how, how the warrant uh, article hearings go. But, okay, yeah. all right. So that's, um, Ms. Marr has, has those dates. We don't need a vote on that. And um, um, that's, that's what we'll go with now for our published, published schedule. Um, next is item 13, request for discussion of Black Lives Matter banner, Elizabeth Ray, Jason Street. Um, Mr. Helmet. Uh, thank you. So I'd like to move receipt, but, uh, but also um, if, depending on how my colleagues are feeling about this, but with a referral to the chair, um, you know, I think that, I think that would be good to close the loop on the discussion. And, um, you know, I, I went back, I wasn't on the board when this was last discussed um, roughly a year ago, but I read, I, I attended that meeting virtually at the time and I read the memo. And I think that uh, the memo that Mr. DeCourcy and Mr. Kiro circulated, uh, you know, raised some, some re reasonable questions that need to be resolved before action could be taken. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of this had to do with integrating what has become um, informal practice with the uh, sign regulations for town hall that were adopted, you know, many several years ago. So I think there's some integration work and some thought that needs to go into this before the board, you know, has an actionable proposal in front of them. So um, I'm also cognizant of the work that we have to do. Um, and, you know, I appreciate the residents passion um, for this. I also think that, you know, there's just a reality that that the board has a lot of business that we we have to get done and we can't always put things on the agenda at, at you know, on, on the last day that the agenda is is finalized. So, you know, I think that um, it's not being on the agenda tonight doesn't mean that we don't think it's important, um, but, you know, we have to juggle a lot of a lot of priorities. So, um, I'm open to amendments of this, but um, and especially for my colleagues who were there, who were here on the board before, before me. But I might start with something like move receipt and a referral to the chair, um, you know, to, to organize study and discussions um, with the intent of you know bringing this topic back to the board um, for discussion and and some kind of action at a future date. Again, you know, work work with that. I think in a way that you think is is uh, is productive. Um, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. I, I'm going to go down um, the, the line here, Mr. Diggins. Well, I'll second that, you know, and, and yeah, you know, I'm fine with discussing, you know, and I, I like, you know, Mr. Hurt Helmuth's um, um, motion, and I could see you know, how we deal with town hall as being one of those sections to maybe add to the handbook. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hurt. Yeah, that's fine of me. I'm, I think just to clarify, I think the discussion to have is generally how we use town hall. Yes. Not a discussion specific to this request. And then I think once we come up with how guidelines for town hall, then however we handle this request and any similar requests falls into that line. Yeah, that is my intent. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. And and uh, yeah. And and I think as as Mr. Helmuth just clarified, I mean that um, if I go back to the memo that we had discussed some time ago, there was discussion of development of a policy, and that's that's um, as Mr. Hurd said, a, a a starting point. So 
um, I'll, I'll support the motion as well. And um, I may look to create a subcommittee to um, look into this and report back to the board. So it, it, what I may do is put this on for either the next meeting or first meeting um, after that. And um, But if members are interested, if they could contact me and then I will um, put it on the agenda and can have further discussion at the next meeting. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, now, uh, new business, uh, Attorney Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have a few uh, items of new business. I just want to raise the board's attention. Uh, I'll try to hit them quickly. First, I, I want to let the board know that I engaged the Mystic River Watershed Association about CSOs. Um, the town engineer and conducted a preliminary review of the current MWRA CSO reports. And I just want to thank Mr. Heron from uh, the Mystic River Watershed Association for his willingness to share so much information and insight, which I think will be helpful for myself. Uh, the manager, the chair, and vice chair, as well as others, um, including the Save the Elect Brook Group, in the coming days and weeks as we get uh, ready for comments. Um, to know that other board members, I mean, to know that board members know what I'm talking about. Secondly, I just also want to note that there was an initial conference of council regarding the UGAR 40B matter, where there is both an applicant and a butter uh, appealing the ZBA's decision. Uh, which I know is of great interest to members of the board and a lot of other folks. Attorney John Witten, our special counsel, is representing the ZBA. And um, while there's not a lot to report right now, I just wanted to note for folks general information that it will probably take a long time before the matter goes to hearing before the HGC, and that there may be an initial opportunity for some mediation. But as Attorney Witten represented to the HGC, it's, it's really important to us that the abutters to their counsel have a seat at that table. Um, third, I just want to thank my staff very quickly, particularly Peter Buckley, for his help in a long litigated case in which summary judgment was recently granted for Arlington Public Schools. And then finally, I also want to note that uh, Deputy Town Council Mike Kenningham is joining the Civic Engagement Group on January 13th to talk more about warrant articles in advance of the closing of the warrant. I had the pleasure of joining the Civic Engagement Group at a previous session, um, so it's, it's a terrific opportunity for folks to learn a little bit more about filing warrant articles and to spend some time with Deputy Town Council coming in. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, given the hour, I'll be very brief. Uh, first, I wanna say thank you to uh, the DPW for their great effort on Friday in addressing the snow removal. Obviously working early morning and long hours, uh, immediately responding to the storm. And then again, overnight on Saturday, doing more crosswalk clearing to make sure that throughout the Mass Ave corridor and railway corridor, people could uh, get around uh, as easily as possible um, doing that snow clearing effort. So big, big thanks to the DPW and uh, at least the preliminary forecast says there might be more to come early next week. So we'll see, we'll see what the future holds in that regard. Um, additionally, I did wanna mention that in coordination with the chair, we did discuss bringing the goals back tonight, but as we looked at the agenda, I think we well predicted how long tonight's agenda would go and did not put the goals on tonight's agenda, but will plan to bring them back on January 24th for the board's consideration. And that's all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Uh, Mr. Helmer. Thank you, no new business. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, and I'll say that picture on the town's website of the snow plows is awesome. You know, I mean, so they, they did a good job and, and uh, I, I like that picture a lot. And, and Mr. Heim, you know, took my thunder, I mean, and so I'm happy when you know, the, the, the town council I mean, promotes something that I'm thrilled about, and that is the, the uh, Warren Arca workshop. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Hurd. No new business. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. No new business, thank you. Okay, I have a couple of items of uh, one, Mrs. Mahan and I, uh, and Mr. Chapdelaine attended the Long Range Planning Committee meeting last Friday. We have another meeting scheduled for January 28th um, with the news that Mr. Chapdelaine reported earlier in terms of the increase in lost revenue through opera funds that will change some of the, um, the figures going forward. The governor's budget is due to be 
released between now and the 28th. And we're still trying to develop consensus. The town manager does have a requirement to issue a preliminary, well, I'll call it a preliminary budget. It is a budget document on the 15th and we're trying to help him um, with that process. But um, I expect that uh, we'll have a further report probably in our first meeting in February as to how things are going on long range planning. Um, I also want to say on the CSL issue, I think board members received a copy of the report that MWRA issued in terms of the water quality standards. Um, Attorney Heim referenced that. Um, I think what we're going to try to do for either the next meeting or, well, the next meeting, I think, is to invite the MWRA, a representative from the MWRA, to our meeting to discuss the issue in ways that um, we can support them in, in locating funds and in finding solutions and um, we'll work with the town manager, the vice chair and attorney Heim on that issue. But February is a critical month for the commentary to the report. And there was a feeling that to gain, try to gain some insight and, and work cooperatively with MW, MWRA, we might be able to achieve that. Um, whether they come to a meeting or not, we'll, we'll find out, but we're gonna do that outreach. Um, two other brief things, I apologize. I didn't know the hour is late. I wanna thank um, Senator Friedman for, there, there's an issue that has come up at AYCC with certain families that are covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield. There are issues on reimbursement for some clinicians where Blue Cross does not reimburse for clinicians that are not independently licensed. Other health insurers cover that. Um, and it looks like Arlington now will be included in a pilot program at Blue Cross Blue Shield where they will reimburse for those services. And it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, one, for reimbursement, but two, for families in need who are Blue Cross subscribers, they were on longer waiting lists because the number of clinicians was more limited in terms of who could reimburse. So that is potentially really good news for AYCC and more significantly for the families in need in terms of what their wait time is. And, and um, I, I just heard that over the weekend. So I wanted to thank her for that. Last thing is Mr. Diggins and I had talked about um, there will be a parking pilot program that is gonna be before us. And, um, I'm gonna try to fit in the next meeting for discussion, not for action but the proponents are working towards getting input and um, bringing something before us. So that's, want to acknowledge that. It is something that a year ago I said to the proponent of a town meeting warrant article that if she agreed to withdraw the warrant article, we would have bring her in to present before the board. Um, she did make a brief presentation last spring, but this will be more of a, a full blown presentation. I'm looking or a presentation commentary for the board from the board, not immediate action um, because it's a complicated issue, but, but at least to receive the um, the study. And Mr. Diggins is working on a um, with the proponents. I believe they want to do a forum for town meeting members in precincts two, three, and four. So that's something to look for later this month. So that is my new business. Um, we do have one last item. It's not on the. Regular agenda, it's an executive session. It's a very brief executive session, but I don't anticipate we will just be coming out of that to for purposes of adjournment. The executive session is to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, um, namely the approval of executive session minutes of December 15th, 2021 and December 20, 2021. If I could look to um, this is Mahan for a motion on the executive session. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to go into executive session um, for the purposes you just described. And um, when we adjourn from executive session, we will adjourn concurrently with our public meeting. Thank you, do we have a second? Second. Okay, the motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. We're in executive session.